Okay. Alrighty. Oh, <sighs> okay. Okay, guys, we're back. We've managed to fix things, okay? So now that we've fixed things, we're gonna go back here. And what we're going to do now is we're gonna go ahead and watch this real fast. Before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and just go to our current chat and I'm gonna go ahead and take our link again, re-spam it in everybody else's thing. Let's go here. Do, 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 do. We're currently live streaming. It's just a cozy stream tonight again. I do apologize for that. OBS is still weird for me. But we are going to keep true to our promise because I promised you guys, I promised all of you guys that we would be watching this and I am going to maintain that, okay? So what I'm going to do now is we're about to watch this by Gail Rubin. Now, many of you probably have never seen this before. New link, please use this link instead. Please use this link instead. I'm gonna go ahead and just say the same thing over and over again to all of the places. Okay. Please use this link instead. Tech problems fixed. I'm gonna go ahead and just spam this everywhere so that everybody knows about it. And hopefully we'll get some other, more people in here. I am sorry about that a, a second ago. I'm still figuring out OBS. I don't quite understand it if I'm being perfectly frank with all of you. Um, but it's okay, because we're in it for the ride, right? We're in it to learn, we're in it to do our thing, okay? And it's okay with me. We're gonna go ahead and fix this up. Alrighty, the Admiral Views. Hey, what are you doing Tuesday night? Ooh, okay. Uh, I would love that. So let me just go ahead and make sure that all of my stuff is spammed appropriately. And then we will go ahead and get started. Alrighty, do 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 do. Let me go ahead and post this here. Make sure everybody knows that I am currently live. Do 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 do. Alright. We have fixed everything, I think. I do declare, I do believe that we have. Hi guys, glad to see some more people here. I'm sorry about what happened a second ago. We are gonna go ahead and get started. We're going to watch Gail Rubin. I'm going to hold true to my promise. Um, and it's gonna be fun, guys. It's gonna be so fucking fun. I'm so excited to watch this all with you because we don't watch this kind of content enough, in my opinion. Now, not everybody agrees with me, but It'll be interesting, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited to see everybody, okay? You know, so it's gonna be fun, okay? We're gonna watch this together. We're going to listen to the long history and I think this will actually be interesting for quite a few people to watch. Um, especially for people who have mixed or uncomfortable views regarding sex work. This is the kind of thing that more people I think need to see and more people need to watch, okay? So once I get all of this straightened away and straightened out, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So let me go over here. Let me go ahead and put this here. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, who is here? Hello, Pachydermis Courtney Game. Yes, you know we're live. We are live. We are live and we are live. Two great things to be grateful for, Courtney. Who else is there? Small Peanut. Hi, darling. Peanut, you are the bomb. You are the bomb.com. God bless you. Thank you for watching this stream tonight, okay? This academic stream. Now, because I like Stardew Valley and because it's a cozy stream, what we are going to do, guys, is I am going to play Stardew Valley. I'm going to plant all of my lovely plants in my new wonderful game. And in the meantime, we're going to watch Gail Rubin. Who else is here? Who is Who are we listening to today? Oh, Gail Rubin. Okay, Gail Rubin is one of the founders of queer theory. So she is a professor. And she is a woman who founded Samoy. It's S-A-M-O-I-S. -S. Um, it was the one of the first... I I think at least it was one of the first lesbian leather communities of her time. She, um, she is an, ad, I don't think she, 
she participated in lesbian BDSM. And specifically, I think she was involved with the production of lesbian pornography that is BDSM related specifically for lesbians. And so from her perspective, she was highly critical of all of the arguments that feminists like Andrea Dworkin, like Catherine McKinnon, were coming out and making about pornography, especially when they were making arguments about pornography being degrading to women. And her critique is specifically from the perspective of someone who um, is was involved with BDSM, but specifically as a lesbian and who is producing uh, pornographic content for other lesbians. So it was completely separable from the context that Andrea Dvorkin and Catherine McKinnon were. And so she has a very unique perspective on this question. And that's why we're going to watch this tonight. You guys tell me what you think in chat. If you guys have a question, I'll stop. We will answer it and we will talk about it together. Is this Gail on the screen? Yes. This is Gail. This is her up here on the screen right now. That's her on the screen right in front of me. Correct. All right. So we're going to watch her. If you guys have any questions, you let me know. I will pause if you guys pop up on the chat off the side. In the meantime, I have parsnips to plant, damn it. And we're not going to let any cozy stream get in the way of our farming games, okay? That's what we're going to do. Adarius, like the stream, comment, and send a super chat. You know it. Based, Adarius. Based indeed, okay? Hit that like and subscribe button. That's what we're here for a Friday night. Cozy streams require like streams and happy people, and of course, cups of tea, which we're about to have presently. Now, let us begin the cozy stream. Without further ado, I give you ladies and gentlemen, Gail Rubin. Let's go ahead and get started. And do let me know if you can hear her, by the way. And show me around. It's been wonderful. It, it is like visiting the Vatican Library. <laughs> uh, those wonderful introductions, and thank you, Brenda, for bringing me here to this remarkable collection. And I have to say, it has really been a thrill can you all hear her? Can everybody hear her right now? Uh, now there is no super chat option, okay? Riches Parsnips are indeed highly underrated. This Cornell is very true. On the topics of sexuality. I'm grateful to the library and the co-sponsors of this Give me a, talk. Let me know if you guys Lubin can hear her, okay? You can hear her? Yes, you can hear her. And to the many wonderful staff of Cornell's rare and distinctive collections who have made time this week to speak to me and show me around. It's been wonderful. Hear. It, it is like Perfect. visiting the Vatican Library of Sex. <laughs> and it's quite wonderful to be here. So for this talk, uh, I'm going to revisit a somewhat traumatic period in my life as a scholar and an activist, the feminist sex wars of the late 1970s and early 1980s. And I'm going to particularly focus on one area, one of the major sites of contention and contestation. That was the bitter an acrimonious conflict over pornography. I should have titled this talk The Feminist Porn Wars because in fact the sex wars were much more extensive than the fight over porn. And just to highlight a few of the areas that people were fighting about, one of the first was the attempt to either marginalize or expel lesbians from the mainstream mm -hmm. women's movement as such that lesbians had to resist exclusion uh, from organizations such as NOW, National Organization for Women. Having resisted uh, expulsion, the lesbian, some lesbians this isn't returned about the no favor fault by questioning heterosexuality Don't ask that question. and claiming I've got that there was plant. no legitimate feminist heterosexuality. Uh, there were some straight women who also made that argument. Then there were discussions of what was properly feminist lesbianism, which resulted in the denigration of butch femme roles in relationships mm -hmm. and the assertion that these were merely rehashed versions of heterosexual arrangements. There were debates over penetration. And was this just a remnant of male supremacy? Was it okay for lesbians to do that? Was sexual fantasy permissible? There was actually an argument that fantasy dehumanized and objectified one's partner, so fantasy was not a good thing to do, which put into also uh, put masturbation in question, although I don't remember reading any specific anti-masturbation text. One of the nastier and more persistent disputes of the, of the 70s was over transsexuals. That was the term at the time, terminology particularly the presence of trans women in feminist and lesbian gatherings. One of the earliest of these surfaced, I believe it was 1973, at the West Coast Lesbian Conference in Los Angeles, where a, a trans woman named Beth Elliott was one of the participants and organizers and was denounced by, among others, Robin Morgan. 
Um, and then in the late 1970s, the presence of a trans engineer for the, who was working for the lesbian recording company, Olivia Records, occasioned another outpouring of anti-trans sentiment, much of which was more or less codified in Jan Raymond's 1979 book, The Transsexual Empire. Antagonism to trans men surfaced only later in the late 1980s after trans men by the name of Luce Sullivan organized a group called F to M for female to male, which was an organization for trans men and, and uh, for female to male cross-dressers. This raised the visibility of trans men. They hadn't, there had been trans men certainly around before that, but it wasn't such a visible population. <laughs> and as soon as they were visible, they then became targets. And similarly, during the mid to late 70s, there was an increasing visibility of SM lesbians, and that then occasioned a rash of anti-SM opinion in the lesbian and feminist press and in lesbian communities. One of the ironies of all of this is that uh, this criticism of sexual acts, of gender identities, of erotic roles, has contributed to a kind of stereotype an erroneous one, I believe, of the women's movement of this period, and especially lesbian feminism, as largely grim and puritanical and hostile mm -hmm. to sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. And while that description might be act, apt for some, it could not be more incorrect. Women's liberation and then lesbian feminism were hotbeds of sexual enthusiasm. The pursuit... <laughs> And the pursuit of lust was probably as intense as the pursuit of political goals. Okay, this is something that I think is a really, really big point. And I think that this is something that Gail Rubin brings up, which is a really good point to bring up about the feminist movement, and especially the women's liberation movement, of why it leaves such a bad taste in our mouths when we think about it, right? Is because it does, you know bring up this idea that like to be a feminist to be a part of the women's liberation movement was to be anti-sex it meant that you were opposed to pleasure you were opposed to enthusiastic sexual encounters i also think that her point that she made earlier about arguments about penetration arguments about you know being masculine about being butch how that you know stigmatized women who were butch lesbians or people who were trans men, right? It meant that women who did not feel comfortable like with being feminine, with, uh, with playing into a feminine role, were immediately pigeonholed as the enemy, right? Which was one of the costs of the rad femme movement and one of the costs of the women's liberation movement and of the porn wars, which she's going to describe here shortly. Let's see here, okay? Uh, what is the point of marriage if one part... Folks, we're not talking about marriage. We are talking about pornography. What are you doing in chat? Are you even paying attention to Gail Rubin? What are you doing? Now is not the time for no-fault divorce, okay? Now is the time for us to watch what some claim to be a cause of divorce. Stay the course, my friend. Pornography should be on the brain. Marriage should not be. Let us continue. And the two were often entangled, energizing one another. You know, I can't tell you how many uh, couples came out of demonstrations and so forth. Uh, it was, uh, there's a lot of sexual energy in the movement. So while there was this critical cool condemnation say, there was a lot of, of sexual, sexual practices and gender the expressions, there were also workshops on how to achieve orgasm. There were workshops on how to masturbate. The late Betty Dodson, you know, was a, a crusader for masturbation. Uh, there were, uh, uh, there, there were. I'm sorry, I love her. She was a crusader for masturbation. I'm sorry, but that's amazing. That is hilarious, isn't that? I just love that. A crusader for masturbation. The crusade is real, okay? The Knights of Templar. <laughs> have now united around the round table that is, I guess, the clitoris. I don't know. <laughs> Let's keep listening, okay? Sessions, including some university classes, on how to look at one's sexual organs so they would be less mysterious. There were campaigns against the monogamy, both in the feminist movement and then in the lesbian feminist movement. Monogamy, you know, had this... Uh, there was a criticism that it was like private property. And I remember as late as 1986, I was at the National Organization of Women Convention in Denver, Colorado, and there were these little tables, you know, where people were selling stuff. And there was one woman who had a button I will never forget. It said, monogamy, monopoly, monotony. <laughs> that was at a now convention. 
Okay. Monogamy, monopoly, monotony. I don't know. What do we think that's still funny? Like, I know in this these communities, we talk about polyamory, we talk about open relationships so much. Like, it would be so interesting, like, to have people to make those arguments from a feminist or women's liberation perspective. Like, are there feminists in these spaces that say basically the same thing? I'm sure there are. If there are, please link them in the chat. Who are the people that would wear the button? I need to know this so I can talk to them on my show. Maybe we'll even make those buttons and we'll pass them out. I don't know. Maybe it's the merch of the future. Let's find out, okay? There were also feminists and lesbian artists and craftswomen busily creating erotic images and objects, and then feminist sex shops such as Eve's Garden in New York, and of course, Good Vibrations in San Francisco, open to provide retail access to sex equipment and information. And these are just a few examples of this very lively and vibrant feminist and lesbian sexual culture that was about to encounter, coming from the other direction, the anti-porn movement, which erupted right around 1977. And I'm gonna focus on the anti-porn movement for a few reasons. First, it's an important context for the emergence of On Our Backs, the subject of this astonishing exhibit next door, and uh, the focus of tomorrow's panel with many of the founders and producers. Second, the conflicts over pornography expanded rapidly and the issue of porn became sort of like a giant planet a huge entity whose gravity then pulled other issues into its orbit. I keep thinking of Jupiter with the moon circling around Jupiter. So this had the effect of, of making some issues more uh, prominent and making others less salient at the time. So for example, SM imagery was highlighted because it was uh, indispensable to the anti-porn claims. So that was something that uh, was highlighted by the so poor Dr. Rubin is a bit old, so I think I should clarify what she means when she says SM. She means sadomasochism, okay? She's talking about BDSM when she says SM. She's talking about SNM, right? But she's a bit older, so I don't think that... So some of the language is a bit antiquated. Um, let me read what you guys are saying in chat, okay? Okay, female liberation potentially made women... Potentially made the women less happy, depending... If you're gonna say that, you need to link that study in chat and you need to say it with your chest, okay? We need to have some actual statistics of Darius, okay? And secondly, I find it kind of hard to believe that, let's see, yeah, we need more We need more stimulation, right? Didn't you already 700% this game? Yeah, I did, but you wanna know something? I love Stardew so much that I'm going to replay it, okay? I'm going to rediscover the joy. Maybe I'll find a new lover in the community, who knows, okay? The long-haired man by the beach. Actually, maybe I will just marry Elliot in this game again, okay? Isn't he adorable? I love him. I, I love him. He's literary, he has his books, he has his piano. He's everything to me. He's everything. Don't take Elliot away from me, no nosebleed. Don't do that to me, please. But anyway, let's go back to, to Gail Rubin. I just wanted to clarify that. And yell at Adarius for not linking his sources and saying what he means with his chest. Uh, anti-porn movement I'm just at kidding. the same time there was you, a Darius. lot less Thank you for focus being a there was a lot more focus on heterosexuality as opposed to in insufficient or inadequately feminist uh, ostensibly inadequately feminist lesbianism uh, lesbian sex practices were not spared condemnation but there was a lot less talk about them uh, trans issues continued to smolder but have more recently, of course, become uh, the sort of leading, bleeding edge of fights over alternatives to heteronormativity, not only among feminists, but of course, the conservative right, which has unleashed this unprecedented barrage of legal and regulatory assaults on trans folk, especially trans kids. The third reason I want to focus on the, the anti-porn movement is that um, these feminist sex wars of the 70s and 80s have been getting a good bit of attention lately, and there's a growing literature that purports to tell their histories and take lessons from uh, these alleged historical accounts. A few of these uh, recent books would be Lorna Bracewell's Why We Lost the Sex Wars, Brenda Kostman's The New Sex Wars, and the one getting the most attention at the moment, and whose name I may mispronounce, um, Amia, is it Srinivasan or Srinivasan? Uh, the Right to Sex. And with respect to the last book, I have to recommend Lisa Dugan's amazingly superb review, which appeared in December in the Boston Review and is also available, I think, by way of the Substack. 
uh, call me Pinko Queer. Uh, in addition- hang on, hang on. What did you just say? Call me Pinko Queer? I need to write this down, okay, so that we can watch it. Okay, so I'm going to write that down. I think that she said, call me Pinko Queer. And if all of you guys could do me a favor, I'm trying to listen to this. Really, any recommendations of books that she has, any recommendations of sources that she has, we need to collect these, okay? We need to collect these. It's your, Darius, it's your favorite uncle from Wickard. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely, okay? All right, but for real, folks, if we hear a source, if we hear the name of a book that she says, we are going to write it down so that we can read it, so that we can be well-informed on this subject. When, that's the goal. That's honestly, that's the goal of whenever we participate in this space, right? When somebody says, like, what a source is, we need to actually read the source, understand it, so that we can talk about it. More young women are opting into OnlyFans, so it seems like there's a market demand for what they're supplying. Yoon, again, I want the source. Do not just say these things, Darius. Give me the link. Drop the link in chat. I will look at it afterwards. If you are going to say make some shit up here, I need to see these links. I need to see these stats. I need to read them myself. And I will take them. I will collect them in my library. But don't just start spouting off stuff like that in this chat, okay? Gail Rubin would not be proud. She would not be proud. Let's keep listening. In addition to its overall insight, Lisa's review also covers tea. aspects of the tea. sex wars that I'm not addressing today, and particularly the central role of queer desires as sites of contestation and all of this. So I'm going to kind of focus in on the porn wars, but there's a lot more going on. These newer books have uh, joined um, uh, some of the earlier literature, such as Carolyn Bronstein's 2012 Battling Pornography, a couple of anthologies edited by Bronstein, Lynn Camella, and Whitney Strub, or Strub. Uh, there have been special issues of Signs, GLQ, and an issue of Communications Review, which is devoted to the now heavily mythologized Ninth Scholar in the Feminist Conference held at Barnard College on April 24th, 1982. And I just realized three days ago that that was the 40th anniversary of the Barnard Conference. So we're 40 years and three days. <laughs> from the, from that 40th anniversary from that anniversary and it was a the Barnard uh, conference was a watership event the moment that the sex wars that had already been raging on the west coast for several years exploded onto the east coast and because it was new york people often think this was the beginning of the sex wars and i i will remind you of that wonderful cartoon the view of the world from ninth avenue where nothing really happens until it's you know uh e east of Ninth Avenue and in New York. In any event, as all of this work accumulates, the histories of these events are being codified and ossified. And unfortunately, much of the received narrative about these disputes, actions, ideas is mistaken, partial, distorted, and frankly wrong. I myself have not yet had time to fully digest these newer publications and have dipped in, only dipped into them, but even a cursory look reveals some howlers of just some basic mistakes. So I'm going to give you a few. For example, in Lorna Bracewell's book, she states the following quote, sex radical feminists like Gail Rubin and Amber Hollabell threw their lot in with civil libertarians like Nadine Strossen and David Richards to form the feminist anti-censorship task force known as FACT. <laughs> this is, there's no footnote for this statement. <laughs> So I can't fathom where she got this, but it's completely wrong. First of all, I had nothing to do with it. I was 3,000 miles away in California, and this was mostly a group of New Yorkers, New York feminists, who mobilized specifically to oppose the mckinnon dworkin style ordinances as these began to proliferate. Uh, I, am, I wasn't there, so, but I am almost certain that neither Amber Hollabell nor Strosen nor Richards were involved in the founding of FACT. Okay, that's really important and I need to write this down. So, we just learned something from Gail Rubin. This is an important thing to remember, okay? Especially when we're looking back at the history of the feminist movement, especially when we're considering pornography and the history of feminist opposition to pornography, okay? It's according to what we just, we just heard from Gail Rubin, which I'm gonna have to do some more digging about. Apparently, there was a group of feminists who were going up against the ordinances put forth by Catherine McKinnon. And apparently that organization was called FACT. And let me go ahead, I'm gonna have to go, okay, FACT, Feminists Against Anti-Porn Wars. 
Anti-Porn Wars by Katherine McKinnon. McKinnon. Cited by Gail Rubin, even though, even though she had nothing to do with it. This is our note-taking stream, guys. We got to take these notes so that we can talk about this later. Talking about porn next week on Wednesday at 6 p.m., okay? When I go in there, I'm going to have some things to say, okay? We got to do our research, and that's why we have to keep watching this video, okay? And again, as I'm, because I'm required to shill, hit that like and subscribe button, please. Thank you. I do know that among the founders yeah, were Carol Vance and Ann Snittow, and that Lisa Dugan and Ann Hunter were Bye, Courtney. In have a good night. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, and I should note love that to Lisa, you, Ann, and Bye. Carol authored an article that was first published in 1985 called False Promises, which is the classic essay explaining why the mckinnon Vorkin ordinances were a really bad idea, especially for feminists and queers. And that essay has been reprinted a number of times, and it's just central reading for anyone interested in these issues. It was just as sharp, it's as sharp today as it was years ago. Um, similarly, in the Srinivasan book, she has a very garbled account of the founding of New York Women Against Pornography, or WAP. She says that emerging out of the protest against the snuff movie in 1976, whereas WAP was founded three years later in 1979, after a series of other organizations, and it was directly preceded and inspired by the San Francisco group, Women Against Violence and Pornography and Media, or WAPM. And elsewhere, um, Srinivasan refers to feminist campaigns against porn in the 1960s. I cannot think of any organized feminist antagonism to porn in the 1960s. And again, there's no citation to this claim, so I can't tell what the heck she's talking about. Okay. That's important to note too, okay? So it sounds to me like what Gail Rubin is saying is that there has been a misrepresentation of some of the details and facts regarding opposition to the anti-porn movement and uh, again, the emergence of the anti-porn the anti -porn movement itself. So she's saying something I have to take a note on here. And what she's saying is that there was no anti-porn movement movement in the 1960s and this is just a, something i'm going to ask everybody else here if ruben says something that isn't true could somebody please give me a link does anybody know is what she's saying here true was there no anti-porn movement in the 1960s i, I mean i guess we're going to have to take on on face value but i think that's something we're going to have to dig into later i kind of doubt that that's true but i don't know let's keep watching to find out okay and then there was this from a review of Srinivasan by oh, Maggie hi, Doherty that was in oh, The Nation. She <laughs> I says, don't know if that's a band word. Well, hi, it's testy. a completely Good garbled account of the Barnard Conference and the protests that followed, that occasion, that <laughs> almost destroyed it. <laughs> According to Doherty, quote, at the 1982 Barnard Conference on Sexuality, the organizers planned a panel discussion on pornography and politically incorrect sex featuring pro-sex feminists, like Gail Rubin and Carol Vance. The panel was met by protests from anti-porn feminists who showed up on campus the day in question. They wore shirts, this part is correct, they wore shirts, shirts, t-shirts that read for a feminist sexuality on the front and against SM on the back and insisted that the conference had been organized by sexual perverts who supported patriarchy and child abuse, unquote. Let me count some of the errors. <laughs> First of all, the protest wasn't against any single panel, it was against the conference as a whole. Second, there was no panel on pornography and politically incorrect sex. There were not really panels, there were workshops. And there was a workshop on pornography. Uh, here it is uh, from the diary of the conference. The, the diary of the conference was the program. And we have a copy here, which I've just donated to the Human Sexuality Collection, if anyone wants to look at it. They already had one in the Honey Lee Cottrell papers, but this one will be cataloged uh, separately. In any event, uh, uh, there was this panel on pornography and there was one on politically incorrect sex, but neither Carol nor I were involved in either one of them. The porn panel was Betty Gordon and Kaja Silverman, and uh, I'm sorry, workshop, I'm already getting this language wrong, the workshop. Uh, on porn was uh, run by Betty Gordon and Kaja Silverman, and the workshop on politically incorrect sex featured Dorothy Allison, Joan Nessel, 
uh, Myrta Quintanales and Muriel Demon. And I think I have, yes, Morgan's photo. And let's see if I can tell you. Um, Joan, Muriel, Joan, Myrta, Dorothy. And I don't know who this is. Jan Bowman. Ah, thank you. Pachydermis. I think porn was a lot more underground thank in the you. 60s. They may not have felt um, the need to resist it. So Carol was true. the academic Possible. coordinator of the entire conference, and I did a different workshop, uh, an early version of my essay, Thinking Sex. And by the way, one of the accusations against the conference was a hotbed of S&M. The most S&M there was at the conference was the little uh, Tom of Finland image that I included on my diary. <laughs> um, there was indeed a protest documented extensively in the literature and by Morgan Gwenwell's photos of the day. Morgan, this is the protest outside the Barnard Gates. <laughs> you might have to kill like Dorchin Leithold or somebody. Because <laughs> uh, we didn't have them. <laughs> this is another of Morgan's photos. and. <laughs> I never I never noticed that until Morgan Morgan the photographer pointed that out and this is the leaflet that was handed out and you know what's funny is people really don't realize this is before you know personal computers so this was done on a typewriter and then the, the title was hand drawn on with probably a magic marker that's the leaflet, and that's the diary. Okay, um, if anyone is interested in the details, I can refer you to Carol Vance's epilogue to Pleasure and Danger, uh, which was the book of papers from the conference and my account uh, of it in my collection of essays, deviations, or the conference program itself, which is full of information about what actually happened at the conference. So there were panels on disability and class and race and aging and all kinds of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. It, it was quite varied. And the whole idea was to have a broader discussion of sexuality and not just focus on porn. Mm -hmm. um, one result of the protests and the deluge of distorted press coverage is that the conference was understood primarily through the lens of the debates on pornography. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly an aspect of its background. But the conference was really much more an expression of other developments, especially the emergence of new intellectual frameworks for thinking about sex and particularly the histories and social structures of sexualities. This was the emergence of what came to be known as social construction was in this era. Mm -hmm. And then um, another context was the recent, then recent ascendance of the conservative right. Okay. One of the things that I'm noticing, and one of the reasons why I wanted to stream this talk to talk about with you tonight, is that normally when we think of the women's liberation movement, when we think about conversations about pornography, when we think about what the feminist response to sex and to pornography and to sex work was, we typically think of it as the Andrea Dworkin response, right? We typically think of Andrea Dworkin. She is the person, right? But one of the things that Gail Rubin is pointing out here throughout this talk is she's talking basically about how a lot of the language and the rhetoric that it was used to critique, pro excuse me, I, I just, oh, I'm sorry, I hope that doesn't, nobody notice that, which I guess I have made, now made more noticeable because I've mentioned it, but she's pointing out that many of these arguments that were made against pornography act and against sex work and against men and against criticizing patriarchy at the time were also arguments that were used and directed towards lesbians, towards trans men, towards um, butch lesbians in particular. And I, it's something I think that we should talk about, right? It's so typical for us to think about, you know, to think about what happened during this time period in terms of merely Dworkin and McKinnon. So we've, I've never even heard of Carol Vance before. I had never even heard of the Barnard protest. I didn't even know who Gail Rubin was before I watched this whole documentary. Um, there's a whole rich history of what it means to be a feminist that we don't usually get to hear in a whole perspective we don't usually talk about. And I think that that's a real shame. And I think that one of the things that she said here just a few seconds ago was she mentioned that even actual scholars or people that have reported upon the Barnard protest or write about what these movements were like during this time get some of these facts wrong. 
And they don't even provide any citations to prove that they're right. They just make shit up on the fly. That's a, a problem that we have, like when we're talking about the history of pornography. It's that, let's face it, it's kind of a seedy thing to look up, right? I mean, because it's going to mean, like, and she's going to sort of explain to you, like, why that is, and I'll comment on it when she does. This isn't work that most people really want to do, right? Really? You do porn studies? Really? You want to study pornography, right? But it matters. It matters to have those studies. It matters to have people that, like, have, have done actual scholarship on it. Especially, like, when we're constantly having conversations about pornography, whether or not it's justified, whether it's moral, you know, criticizing OnlyFans, right? We have to go back in time. We have to know what the history of it was, actually was, in order for us to have a reasonable discussion about it. Let's keep listening. She's going to tell us a little bit more about this conference. I also think that it's interesting that, as she put it, the conference and what they were talking about in this conference was actually just about sex in general, and it was actually about sexuality in general, but it became known as the porn conference with the porn panel because that was the lens through which we understand this. So let's keep watching and let's keep seeing what the rest of what she has to say. The political power, this was two years after Reagan was elected to the presidency and when organizations such as Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority were among those pursuing anti-feminist, anti-gay, anti-queer, anti-abortion, uh, uh, agendas, much of which actually has been put into place, which is kind of scary to think about, some of it not. But uh, there now, of course, is a, a much more active attempt to put the rest of it in place, uh, whatever wasn't accomplished. One thing one can say about the conservative right is that they play the long game and they play it really well. In addition, uh, back to the Barnard Conference, it was also a manifestation of a resurgence a feminist interested in a feminist interest in sexuality more broadly conceived, wary of the narrow narrow focus on porn and the contents of that focus, uh, and much richer. So, for example, the uh, heresy sex issue, which was published in 1981, um, the uh, powers of uh, I'm sorry, the Barnard Conference, which was in uh, 1982. Uh, 1983 saw the publication of the Powers of Desire anthology edited by Ann Snittow, Sharon Thompson, and Christine Stanzel, and of course, Pleasure and Danger, uh, the papers from the uh, Barnard Conference edited by Carol Vance, which came out in 1984. Mm -hmm. So this was a period of ferment within feminism over issues of sexuality, uh, during which many trajectories converged. And as this period becomes history, small errors such as those about you know what was going on at barnard and who found it fact and all these other kind of uh easily checked facts i mean these are all in the published documents you don't even have to go to the archives to get those right these small errors are uh, of easily determined matters of fact are symptomatic of a larger problem much of the current crop of literature on the sex and porn wars is profoundly ignorant not only of the details, but the issues and the stakes of these earlier conflicts. Some of this newer literature has not consulted even some of the published texts, much less come to the archives. So there's a growing tendency uh, to pontificate on these earlier conflicts without understanding what was actually going on in them, and with a very limited sense of the analytic range and the contents of those debates, which Lisa points out in her review of Srinivasan. Moreover, much of what is accepted as history is simply the circulating narratives and assumptions about the events and the arguments. This is a larger problem, I think, with our entire intellectual and public culture, the tendency to just regurgitate whatever is on the internet or on social media mm -hmm. and not actually doing research to find out what is true. That is a very good point. Um, I think this is, I mentioned, I keep saying Dworkin, 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 but that's in part because like, if you go on to TikTok and if you swipe through, especially a lot of radical feminist TikToks when you're going through it, you will see, and this is a really bad habit that a lot of people have, especially a lot of people who create core content creators, they do something that's called quote mining. Quote mining is where you pick up a book, okay? And let's see, I'm just, I'm just gonna pick up like, I'll show you what I mean, okay? I'm gonna show you what I mean, okay? So. Let's suppose for a minute that I just helped my sister earlier today with her secular humanist paper, okay? 
And one of the things that I did earlier today was I was helping her like talking about like secular humanism. So we were talking about the 1800s. We were talking about thinkers during the time. And because I did some research earlier about Christian nationalism, I showed her a few quotes from various letters from Thomas Jefferson. So I'll read to you one of these quotes that I sent to her, okay? See if I can find it. Do, 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 do. Where did I put that? It's around here somewhere, okay? Let's see, let me put here Jefferson. Sorry, guys, I put everything in my notes here. So here's an example, okay? So it's easy, I think, for us to find a great deal of quotes, right? From Thomas Jefferson, from John Adams, from George Washington, saying, and you if you just found a random quote from within what they were saying, it's easy to believe that they were extremely religious people, that they cared about founding the nation as a Christian nation. I mean, I unironically have heard people making that argument so many times, right? And why are people able to get away with saying it? Well, they're able to get away with saying it because they're able to pull out like random quotes that make it seem like they believe this, okay? So here's an example. So let's see if I can find it in here. Sorry, I have to go through like what I wrote down here. Ah, where is it? Okay. Okay. Here's an example, okay. So I'm just going to read to you an example, okay? So this is a quote from the Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. For those of you, if you have this book, it's on page 299. It's a part of the Norton Anthology of American Literature in the 8th edition. So this is where it is, okay? So let, I'm just going to read this. <clears throat> I never doubted, for instance, the existence of the deity, that he made the world and governed it by the providence, that the most serviceable... The most acceptable service of God was the doing of good to man, that our souls are immortal, and that all crime will be punished and all virtue rewarded either here or hereafter. These I esteemed the essentials of every religion, and being to be found in all the religions we had in our country, etc., etc., right? So it's easy to read a quote like that and to assume that Benjamin Franklin and many of the founders of the United States were deeply religious people, right? And that the nation was founded as a Christian nation because I promise you, you can find and pull out so many quotes like these from their letters, from their texts, that you ignore the broader context of what they're talking about, okay? If you actually sit down and you read the entire autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, if you go through the rest of the context of this quote, what you find is that he's really taking more of a secular humanist approach to faith. So for instance, like if you scroll back, like just even a few pages to like part one of his autobiography, he talks about his, I think it's his grandfather or great grandfather nailing a copy of the, of a, a King James version of the Bible to the underside of his stool so that he would, so that they wouldn't be arrested so that they could read the Bible in its original language. Um, Actually, let me see, okay? Let me see here, okay? So, like, this is actually the quote. So, on page 251, when my great-grandfather read into his family, he turned up the joint stool on his knees, turning over the leaves, then onto the tapes. One of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparatur, and I cannot pronounce that for the life of me. I am so sorry. What that means is an officer of an ecclesiastical court, in case a court established ultimate heresy, who was an officer of the spiritual court. In that case, the stool was turned down again upon its feet, and the Bible remained concealed as it was before. So Franklin's perspective when he's talking about this, he is talking about, like he used, he went into multiple churches. He was not really a deeply spiritual man and he wasn't religious in the same way that what we think of as religion. So when we talk about like what it is to be religious, we think of it as believing in the supernatural, right? Believing in the virgin birth, if you're a Christian, uh, believing in, um, the existence of Jesus's miracles, believing that Jesus came back from the dead. But it's important to understand that for the majority of the founders, they viewed religion as a system, a, a code of conduct, a system of morality. They did not believe in most of the spiritual or supernatural elements of the Bible, right? And yet, so if you were just quote mining, right? If you're just going through the text and you just yank out a quote and you slap it onto a TikTok video and you mass produce it, it makes it seem as though they are highly spiritual and do in fact, are in fact the, um, do in fact have the same version of Christianity that many Christian nationalists want to project. The same thing happens with this stuff, with Dvorkin, with our conversations about the women's liberation movement. People will go in and they will take quotes 
They will rip out screenshots, uh, not screenshots, but photographs. They will find clips of something that Dvorkin said or Catherine McKinnon said. They will uh, superimpose like a quotation from that. And they will misrepresent what the text actually says within its entire context. So just so you're all aware, beware of quote mining. Quote mining is dangerous. Read the text, take your notes. And with that, let's continue to listen. Uh, it's something that drives me nuts every day. Um, in any case, there, the inattention to primary sources often results in the reiteration of many myths about the sex seizing wars, on pistachios. Or the acceptance of claims Obviously as salt, that were actually contested. I'm a salty person. Such as that porn is uniquely pernicious. Let's keep watching. Uh, and all other media, or that porn is responsible for the entire structure of oppression of women and gender stratification. Um, that is actually one of the ones that has been accepted uh, as if it's been proven. And another version that's, pre I've noticed this in philosophy journals, where the debates on porn are mostly over whether porn is a speech act. Mm. So the, the, this is really interesting. It, you'd think philosophers would go back to think about their premises. But if you start with the premise that porn is uniquely pernicious, pernicious, and what you really want to establish is whether it's a speech act or not, because you're concerned about whether it can be protected by the First Amendment, and you don't go back to check on whether porn actually fits this description, then everything that follows is kind of irrelevant. Uh, it's just people accepting these premises and then trying to figure out if the law can be applied. And there are two things wrong with this. First of all, I leave the details of speech act theory to the philosophers. I'm not good at that. But actually, pornography has already been largely excluded from the protections of the First Amendment. So the whole argument over whether it's a speech act or speech is kind of irrelevant. The courts have ruled repeatedly that obscenity, which is the major legal category for regulating porn, is not protected by the First Amendment. So speech mm -hmm. act or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the other, of course, is that these approaches begin with a largely unexamined assumption, uh, these premises of which are usually une unexamined, that porn is uniquely bad, and therefore you have to figure out how to regulate it, rather than is this correct, a description in the first place. So part of why I want to revisit the beginning of these debates, I want to go through some of the ways that this characterization of porn was established, and what's wrong with the arguments that were used to establish yep. it. So I'm going to focus on that. Uh, early anti-porn movement, particularly as I encountered that in sounds its delicious, phase, nose which blade. was roughly 1987 to 1983. And boy, you know, looking back on how long it's been, I do feel I wore my dinosaur tie today. Because <laughs> That's adorable. I do I feel like, you know, an ambulatory fossil coming out of the matrix. <laughs> um, and on that note, I'm That's going to have amazing. to have a sip of water. <laughs> It's also impossibly long ago. Um, anyway, um, so just to review, the first feminist anti-pornography um, organization was in San Francisco. It was Women Against Violence in Pornography and Media. It was known as WavePAM. And WavePAM actually started to take shape late in 76, but it really became established early in 1977. And it ceased operating in 1983. It kind of fell apart in 1983. Um, Wei Pam then in 1978 held the first major feminist conference on pornography. Take, it was called, uh, the book based on that was called Take Back the Night. And that was the, um, uh, the, the book of the pe conference papers. It was published in 1980. And if you really want to know what the anti porn movement looked like, uh, you know, before 1983, you have to look at this book. It's, okay. it's revelatory. By Laura Letterer. Uh, okay. That Let's conference that. in 1978 that WAPM put on is what sparked the formation of WAP, Women Against Pornography, in New York in 1979. That did not emerge out of the snuff protest. That's mm -hmm. a whole other trajectory. Yep. It emerged out of this conference um, in, um, in San Francisco, and the New York people who came went back to New York and said, oh, yeah, we need to do something like this. So they did. And then as WAPM faded, WAP really became increasingly central to anti-porn feminism until it too closed shop. And I've been able to figure out exactly what year they closed shop, but it was sometime between 88 and 1990, as best okay. I can determine. There were lots of other anti-porn groups, but none with the scope and influence of WAPM and WAP. 
Wait, and wow. there's a second phase of the anti-porn movement that starts in 83, 84, in which some people mistake as the beginning of the anti-porn movement. And that was when um, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin introduced their so-called civil rights anti-porn ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, increasingly, the remaining anti-porn activists and organizations adopted the ordinances as their preferred goal. And it was to contest those ordinances that fact indeed was founded. Um, and that's a really different phase of the anti-porn movement than the early phase. So Take Back the Night is sort of the early phase, and then the McKinnon Dwork and Ordinance is the next phase. Mm -hmm. um, then by uh, 1986, the ordinance had been declared unconstitutional in the United States, and many of the key remaining anti-porn activists shifted their attention um, to trying to abolish prostitution instead of porn. Uh, they migrated into a resurgent movement around trafficking and they helped to make that movement uh, surge. But the wing of the movement in which they uh, uh, ended up is that which defines as its target, not coerced labor and coerced and, and exploitation of migrants and so forth, but simply commercial sex and prostitution. Um, I was gonna end this with a discussion of the anti-trafficking movement and the different wings of it and how they define trafficking. I'm not going to have time clearly today, so I'm not going to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. But just briefly, uh, this particular understanding of trafficking, uh, while rooted in the larger history of anti-prostitution activism that goes back to the 19th century, is very much shaped by the conceptual frameworks and in many cases, the actual personnel mm -hmm. from the anti-porn movement. Many of them have just migrated into anti-trafficking. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, to re so to recap briefly, the chronology of the feminist anti-porn movement would be as follows. First, the era inaugurated by WavePam, in which pornography became a major focus and many other issues kind of faded to the margins, mm -hmm. which is one of the objections that feminists like me and Lisa and Carol and many others had about it. Like, what happened to the rest of the agenda? Why are we only talking about porn now? Mm -hmm. um, then there the second... Uh, then the that is a really good point. And that's something that maybe we should talk about more, that the focus is so hard right now on talking about pornography, on discussing pornography, on the problems in pornography, that there is less of a focus on other problems, like sex trafficking, like prostitution. Um, there are many other feminist issues that clearly they were focused on at the time, that this conversation about pornography sort of subsumed. I wonder if that's something that we still focus on today. There's the ascendancy of WAP and New York, and then there's the turn toward the state with the ordinance. And then f there's the transition uh, into activism against sex work, uh, which is, happens really around 88, 89. So um, I would argue, I mean, Carolyn Bronstein says it's only WAP that really starts, she, she thinks that WAP was the first real anti-porn organization. I disagree. I think it was WAPAM. It's true that before either of these organizations, Bronstein, there had been writers who had previously denounced porn, such as Susan Brown Miller, who spent several pages uh, denouncing porn in Against Our Will. That was in 1975. And it should be noted, Andrew Dworkin is often sort of retrospectively uh, uh, credited with starting the anti-porn movement, but she really didn't. And the book that she wrote on porno the, her book, Pornography, was not published until 1981, which is four years after the founding of WAPAM. Now, she did have an earlier book, Woman Hating. Okay. Oh, this is a WAP demonstration. Sorry, I forgot to show you that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where this is. I'm imagining Times Square, but is it Times Square? Anyway. You can see the uh, the idea somehow that porn is responsible for violence against women, um, as if there are no other causes. Mm. Um, anyway, this was uh, Andrea Dworkin's earlier book, Women Hating, and it did have a section on pornography, but as you can see from the table of contents, it also had a section on uh, fairy tales, a discussion of foot binding, a chapter on witch burning, and a long and actually quite fascinating discussion of androgyny, um, and in this respect, woman hating was actually kind of typical of feminist tomes of the era. These often included chapters on the sexism of some genre of literature. And in, uh, in, in um, 
Dworkin's case, she picked on two uh, literary uh, SM novels from France, uh, Story of O and The Image, and then uh, Suck Mag I Suck, which I think was a magazine. I, I was trying to get a copy of the book today so I could check to see what the heck Suck was. Mm -hmm. But I think it was probably some magazine uh, or what? I'm sure you have it. I just didn't know. <laughs> we could find out. This would be good. This is what's wonderful about archives. And I'm an anthropologist. I came to archives late in life. I was not trained in this, but I just love them. When I was at Harvard, I wanted to get a cot and move into the Schlesinger and just stay there. Uh, I, I spent a semester there. Unfortunately, not nearly enough time in Schlesinger. Anyway, um, so I want to compare this to another book from the era, Kate Millett's Sexual Politics. Mm -hmm. And you note that she also has a whole section on literature, much of which was at one time considered pornographic, D.H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, Norman Mailer, and Jean Genet. So, you know, the difference between what she's doing and what Dworkin is doing is not that great. They're both going after certain literatures mm -hmm. uh, as part of the structure of sexism, but they have many other factors there. So what Dworkin is doing in Woman Haiti, even though she has a section called pornography, is not what the anti-porn analysis actually was when that movement happened. Uh, and the other thing to realize is that these scattered indictments of pornography did not lead to the formation of organizations mm. um, or activism around porn. That only took off with the formation of WAPAM. And you know, watching WAPAM kind of make porn the center of feminist um, concern, it, it, it felt to me like some sort of mutation, you know, like something weird had happened because mm -hmm. it was so different from yeah. the way that most feminist criticism had operated up to that time. Okay. And I want to say that the pivotal figures uh, who founded Way Pam were sociologist uh, Diana Russell, who provided most of the work, mm -hmm. Susan Griffin, the po uh, writer and poet who contributed much of the rhetoric, and uh, Laura Letterer, who edited Take Back the Night, and whose formidable in administrative skills probably account for a good deal of Wave Pam's swift consolidation and significant impact. Mm -hmm. um, and in her book, Battling Pornography, Carolyn Bronstein uh, names Kathy Barry as another founder. Kathy Barry was the author of the 1979 book, Female Sexual Slavery, uh, which is um, uh, and Barry, it's interesting. Barry was, I, I've actually been through the WAPAM records Female at the GLBTHS, GLBT Historical Society, and she's not on the membership list, but she's clearly there at the demonstrations. There are photographs of her with Who signs. So Kathleen she was Barry. very involved. Okay. I don't know that she ever signed up. Um, By Kathleen and she would become Barry. increasingly salient in the late 1980s when mm -hmm. all of this energy that had been focused okay. on porn moved over to prostitution because that was her main interest was uh, sex work. Mm -hmm. So here's my story. I encountered Way Pam myself when I first moved to the Bay Area in the spring of 1978. I was a grad student. I'd been hired to teach a class at Berkeley for one quarter on advanced feminist theory. <laughs> and uh, I had not yet, I didn't have a formulated position on porn or the anti-porn movement. Uh -huh. And I want to learn more about it. And two of my best, brightest, most enthusiastic students, of course, they were deep into Way Pam, and they said, hey, we'll take you to the slideshow, which they did. Okay. And I went, and that was that was the experience that changed my opinion of all of this. I was completely open to a feminist critique of pornography, which would, if it had been like the feminist critiques of pretty much all other forms of media at the... Okay, so what, just to preempt, like, what she's about to say... Here, Gail Rubin is about to say that, like, the way that pornography was talked about was significantly different in terms of analysis and compared to other pieces of literature. So when she's talking about D.H. Lawrence and when she's talking about Norman Mailer, when she's mentioning those, she's talking about, like, misogynistic texts that were written at the time. So one example of this, and we'll watch this later, is a horrible book written by Norman Mailer, who was one of the most pugnacious and kind of ugly authors who dominated during the 20th century. Um, I think there's there's a wonderful article that talked about Christopher, written by Christopher Hitchens, like talking about Norman Mailer. And it talks about how he almost punched a guy in a bar because someone called his dog gay. <laughs> it sounds like something out of a South Park episode, but I swear it's true. There was another 
we have to see this, we are going to see this, I promise you that we will, where Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal, they're in the Dick Cavett show, and they, and bef after the Dick Cavett show, because basically Gore Vidal ripped him a new one for being a misogynist in a book called The Prisoner of Sex, and for being extremely horrible to Kate Millett and many of the other feminists at the time, and when they were on the stage together, which we will watch soon, okay, basically afterwards, Gore, Norman Mailer headbutted him and attacked Gore Vidal. It was one of the most batshit things, but it absolutely happened. And we will see this later. But, so that was an example. So Norman Mailer was a misogynist that he's, talk, that he's talking about. She's also referencing D.H. Lawrence. And D.H. Lawrence, for those of you who forgot, was the author of Lady Chatterley's Lover. And Lady Chatterley's Lover was an example of a book, and it's pretty milk toast, to be honest with you, if you read it. And not as great in some places as you might think. But pornographic for the time, because it said, you know, basically the F-U-C-K. Because it says, like, C-U-N-T, that kind of thing, right? And that's the reason, like, why the book was considered to be scandalous at the time, because it had such vivid portrayals of sex, right? And what Gail Rubin is saying is originally, prior to Wave Pam, that the way that feminists like Andrew Dvorkin and uh, I'm, I'm sure, who was the other one? Someone can remind me. Who was the other person that she mentioned? Andrew, uh, Kate Millett, um, looked at these different texts. They just analyzed it like all of these other pieces of literature. They looked at it in the same way as they did like fairy tales or foot binding or um, research concerning like uh, a witch burning, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're going to hear from her, and this is the pivotal part where Gail Rubin is going to talk about why she changed her mind on pornography, okay? What was it about the conference that made her change her mind? Let's go ahead and give a listen to hear what it was. The time, but that's not, I was, so I was familiar with that. I mean, we were critical of everything. Um, you know, everything from children's literature to the walls of the museums. So you can do that to porn, really, that was not a problem. I expected something from like that but it isn't what I found. Mm -hmm. And that's what yeah. really changed my attitude. This was something different and unlike any feminist experience I had previously encountered. One unique feature of the way Pam slideshows and later WAP was the limitations on discussion. Mm -hmm. No one in the audience was allowed to question the presentation, present alternative interpretations of the, of the images, mm. get an explanation of the selection of the evidence, or even get a clear definition of pornography. None of this could be... Okay, we need to write this down, okay? So this is something that I am going to talk about probably next week, okay? No discussions were allowed. No clear definition of pornography was given. And what was the third thing that she said? She said, no questions were allowed. That's not good, guys. That means that the way that they were talking about pornography and, and having an academic conversation about what should be done about pornography was significantly different than in comparison to the way other texts were discussed at this time. So let's keep listening. Be brought up. We were now supposed to fervently oppose this thing without it ever being defined. And I was like stunned by this. So I started to try to ask questions and, and ask, you know, uh, what's the category? How are you defining it? Why this image or that one? I'll say a little more about that later. But no one was allowed to do that. You, they would say things like, now that you know how terrible porn is, let's see what you can do to stop it. Mm -hmm. That was it. And if you doubt me, there are two written accounts of the WAP slideshow in New York that are very similar. One was by Paula Webster and one by John D'Amelio, and they described the same thing which is there was no discussion permitted. So I began to articulate my uh, questions, comments, and criticisms publicly and quickly became persona non grata and the target of personal attacks. And these kinds of attacks were a pattern of conduct that would uh, continue throughout those years. And it's one of the reasons we call these, we call these the sex wars instead of the sex discussions. <laughs> you could have a discussion. <laughs> there was no discussion. So all this is very old history in many respects, and the issue of porn uh, kind of abated within feminism, although I anticipate a reprise any minute. Um, personally, I was relieved to see the anti-porn fever kind of subside because I wanted to work on other things. I've never actually been that interested in porn. I'm interested in regulation and the effects of regulation and mm -hmm. what all of this meant for everything else that I was 
uh, wanted to know about, but I, I'm not a porn scholar. Never have been and never will be. You know, they still have this journal, Porn Studies. If anyone wants to get porn scholarship, you go to that or Linda Williams, those people. They actually study porn. Uh, okay, hang on. Let's write that down. Okay, guys. So let's see. Linda Williams. Sorry, guys. Linda Williams, porn scholarship. Unironically? Like, here's the thing about, like, trying to have, like, a conversation about pornography, a real conversation about the scholarship behind porn, right? There's no way of doing that without feeling, like, really seedy and gross about it, right? Like, most, and I think this is actually a barrier to the conversations that we have about pornography, about its legalization, about if it should be stigmatized, et cetera, et cetera. It's because I don't hear a lot of people, like, t mentioning these books, right? I don't hear a lot of scholarship actually happening. I don't hear a lot of people digging into the archive, and I, I wish that more people would. I wish more people would actually do this research instead of just looking at a bunch of random statistics off of what is it, the Institute for Family Studies. That's not a good place. Let's keep listening. I do not. So I've happily worked on other things since uh, the early 1980s, but while these wars receded and changed form, unfortunately, they never really ended. And the legacies of anti-porn feminism continue to shape a good deal of our current landscape of law policy and social action with respect to sexual conduct. So I think it's important to note how, first of all, how peculiar this obsession with pornography was in the context of feminist politics in the decade before the founding of Waypam. Early radical feminism and women's liberation were incredibly concerned with sex, sexuality, women's sexual pleasure, along with violence, rape, and battery, and a lot of other things. In the formative phases from the late 1960s well into the 70s, the assorted facts, fa uh, f I'm sorry, <laughs> facets of the women's movement were concerned with pretty much every manifestation of gendered inequality and the uneven distribution of social goodies and liabilities and the mechanisms that kept those things unequal. Mm -hmm. The early publications such as Boston's uh, No More Fun and Games, or Journal of Female Liberation, and New York's notes from the first, second, and third years, which were actually published, I just discovered today, in mm -hmm. 68, 70, and 71, so they skipped a year. <laughs> but they still called it first, second, and third. Well, anyway, but these early journals make this abundantly clear. These were two of the first kind of compilations of the kinds of discussions people were having. The first issue of notes uh, from the first year, from 68, included a piece called Women Rap About Sex. It's a compilation, of, a compilation of conversations that had been compiled by Shulamith Firestone, and it was mostly a litany of complaints by women about not getting their fair share of orgasms and sexual pleasure. That's in notes for the first year. It also included Anne Coates' very famous article, The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm, one of the most widely read and frequently reprinted dissections of the prevailing assumptions about women's sexual anatomy, in which... Uh, uh, which were really, was also basically a cry for more women's sexual pleasure. Um, this issue of notes also featured a funeral oration for the burial of traditional womanhood, speeches about abortion, whose illegality was a major concern of the movement, and subsequent issues of the notes were much more comprehensive and featured just a few of the topics, critiques, critiques of love, not just porn, but love. Mm -hmm. Politics of housework, boy, that was a big one. Economic discrimination, uh, you know, at the time, women were making, I don't know, 50 cents to the dollar. There was all this job discrimination. Frankly, when I went to college as an undergraduate, there were almost no women on the tenure, tenured faculty at any department except maybe nursing or something. But, you know, in history, we had actually the anthropology department in Michigan had two tenure track women and was, I think, the only other department that had uh, that many was psychology. And there was one in history, Sylvia Thrupp, but she was, <laughs> this is a really interesting story. She was occupying something called the Palmer chair, money for which had been given in the 1930s to hire a woman uh, in the history department. The history department resisted for about 30 years and wouldn't hire anyone. And they tried to get uh, the, the terms of the endowment changed so they could hire a guy. And they finally hired Sylvia who was a medievalist and really quite remarkable. Uh, but you know, there, there were very few women in and there was a, the glass ceiling was real. I mean, people, working class women aspired to be secretaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard to get above that. In medicine, you know, women were nurses, doctors were men. I, I could go on, but uh, this was a different world. And um, 
anyway, to get back to it. Uh, so, and also the other thing is women could hardly get credit. Women couldn't get credit cards. Women couldn't get mortgages. I mean, this, there were a lot of things that were on everybody's mind. Uh, consumerism, the Miss America contest, there was an essay by T. Grace Atkinson going after the, quote, institution of sexual intercourse long before Andrew Dworkin wrote about intercourse. There were discussions of man-hating, class differences, the legal system, article, more articles on abortion, which was a major concern prior to Roe. If you read this early stuff, you see what a major, and it's about to be a major concern again, or <laughs> already is. There were essays on feminist history, black, black feminism, lesbianism, male violence, rape, and the classic article, one of my favorites, Why I Need a Wife, <laughs> on the many personal services which women routinely prefer, performed and men expected and enjoyed. Uh, and there were lots of articles on the sexism in children's books. That was a big topic, more than porn, children's books. And there were some articles on prostitution, but also a lot on marriage. There was just as much concern with marriage as an oppressive institution as prostitution. And in fact, there was a lot of pro-prostitution. Part of, if you read notes from the first, second, and third year, one of the things that those women were doing was going and bailing women out of the mm -hmm. Women's House of Detention who had been arrested on sex charges. Okay. Um, so what's notable about the literature from this period is the variety and range of concerns. Right. No aspect of experience, no institution was spared feminist uh, critique. And inequalities at every level were examined and programs articulated to reconstruct the power differentials in every aspect of social life. Other big theme themes were religion, the economy, of course, educational systems, marriage and family structures, sports. This was before Title IX, the law and like I said, all of culture, all media. There were critiques of music, art, mass media, museums, movies, TV, advertising, and literature was a favorite topic, as you can see from Kate Millett. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really interesting going back and seeing the special concern with children's books. That's really a, a major focus in this early literature. Um, there were also uh, intense conversations about the unequal distribution of at that point, mostly heterosexual, sexual gratification. And everything was up for grabs. Money, time, respect, housework, ego gratification, spiritual authority, who could be a, a minister or a priest or a rabbi, yep. physical Mary safety, Daly. personal service, Mary and Daly is orgasms. A wonderful and what's also notable is that if pornography was mentioned at all in any of this early literature, it was kind of in passing, you know, just kind of a throwaway in a list or something. Um, there's a lot less about porn than there is about children's books and marriage. So a major, um, the other thing I wanted to say is that a major cause, of, a major um, preoccupation in feminist writing in this period was the identification of what caused male supremacy and gender inequality. Okay. A huge amount of the early literature was concerned with trying to figure out why we were in this situation where men had all this power and privilege and women much less. So there were a lot of causes that were proposed. First, there was, you know, the classic uh, Frederick Engels, private property, the family, and the state. Okay, let's go ahead and write this down, okay? So the first thing that she said was private property, private property of the family and the state. I think this is actually a reason, I've spoken to a few other radical feminists before, or I've at least been participated them with them in Discord servers. And this is a big reason why socialism and like why a lot of rhetoric around radical feminism and why it's different from liberal feminism is often critical of capitalism and often has a socialist uh, flair to it because it recognizes women as a class and not simply as, and that's a key difference I think between liberal feminism and between, um, <coughs> and between um, radical feminism. So as I understand it, if you are an egalitarian feminist, if you are a liberal feminist, you see men and women as individuals within society. And the goal of feminism is simply so that men and women can be equal, right? It's so that men and women can exist equally and have the same opportunities within society. Whereas radical feminism believes that, you know, essentially that women exist together as a class, that women are discriminated against as a class, and that it is not simply, you know, and they're not simply seeking individualized liberation for each person as an individual. Uh, let me see if I can actually find for you. I'm actually going to read this out loud to make sure that I don't get this wrong. And 
Let me see if I can find exactly like what this is, okay? Forms, let me see here, FAQ, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and just read this out loud to you. Just go ahead and just to, just to sort of really, really clarify like what the difference is, okay? So this is a, this is a, these are some notes that I have, okay? So the main difference between radical feminism and mainstream feminism, also referred to as choice feminism or liberal feminism, is that radical feminism operates on a collective basis, as I stated before. This means that the movement requires significant social and political activism, whereas liberal feminism operates on an individual basis. Liberal feminists believe that feminism is, is an interpersonal decision. So the decision to wear makeup, the decision to, wear, to sell pornographic content, etc., etc., and opposition to these choices are therefore not feminist. And according to somebody who's a radical feminist, this ideology fails to recognize the systemic and intentional way in which patriarchy sells these ideas in order to create a faux sense of female empowerment. Despite the, the only beneficiaries, according to radical feminists, um, of these actions being men. So, for example, makeup companies fill the pockets of the elite. Beauty companies and CEOs uh, benefit from continual beauty trends, which assault women, etc., with uh, unrealistic expectations of beauty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So let me see, do, 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 okay? So radical feminists also invoke, invoke class analysis and understand men as a class that oppress women as a class. Liberal feminism represents a gender egalitarian approach by which men and women must strive for equality. Radical feminists see patriarchy as a structure which prohibits any formal or informal equality. And so patriarchy has to be entirely abolished, okay? So that's the reason why radical feminists are significantly different from liberal feminists, okay? It's because they view the sexism that exists within society as not merely a matter of us getting along together as individuals, but rather as like women as a class abolishing patriarchy um, from men who oppress women as a class, if that makes sense. So let's see here, Paul, uh, observer, state of affairs. Okay, let me see, I'm so sorry here. Pr primitive communism, yes, pretty much debunked. I imagine the speaker will talk about how patriarchy came after that, some sort of corruption of the original state of the affairs in the egalitarian. Well, let's see, I, I don't know. I don't know, political observer, I don't know. Let's continue to watch to find out, okay? I just wanted to clarify before we moved on, because I think that's often confusing for some people. Oftentimes when people hear like what radical feminism is, there is a confusion about like what is the difference between being a radical feminist as opposed to being a liberal feminist. And it's not just regarding, I mean, there are some radical feminists that are actually very pro-trans. It's not just about transgender stuff and it's not just about pornography. It's, it's, it's not just that. It is the underlying philosophy behind how you understand what sexism means within society and how we should address it. That's the difference, the key difference between a liberal feminist and between a radical feminist. So let's continue to listen. Uh, there was the armed patriarchal revolt that also <sighs> goes to Engels, but there was also capitalism, imperialism, the sexual division of labor, motherhood, mammalian reproduction, hormones, male propensities for violence. Um, the more fine-tuned analysis shied away from these major generalizations to focus on particular social structures, such as theologies and institutions of major religions, specific economic arrangements like wage job segregation and, and low wages, um, and a whole bunch of laws restricting women's ability to function socially ed, um, or economically, and the multiple secular ideologies that rationalize male supremacy and sexual moralities um, again, I can't think of a single example from this period that indicted porn as a major cause of anything. Uh, so it, that was my background in feminist literature when I ran into the anti-porn movement. And I just thought many of its claims were frankly preposterous and frankly contradicted by all the data that we already had in the accumulation of feminist scholarship up to that time. I mean, if you'd read the feminist scholarship, you'd look at this and say, what are they talking about? And that was my uh, approach, or that was my reaction. However, there's more to the story. By the late 70s, porn too, uh, and how long do I, I've been going on? Anyway, I'll, I'll try to get through this. Porn too was in a um, 
state of, of historical transformation. I don't have time to go into great detail about the history of obscenity laws and their uh, relative relaxation in the mid to late 20th century. But just briefly, pornography itself is both a recent category and uh, it's never been an entirely stable one. Mm. The best book I know on this is Walter Kendrick's The Secret Museum. If you want to know how porn kind of gets different meanings over time, it, it's a wonderful book. The Secret Museum. And actually, until the late 20th century, pornography was not a legal category. Obscenity was a legal category. That's what got um, okay. regulated. That's true. Okay. The first federal obscenity law was the Comstock Act in 1873, which criminalized not only sexual material, but anything relating to contraception and abortion, which is important to remember. Um, and the Comstock laws were federal, so they only covered things crossing state lines or otherwise under federal jurisdiction sent through the mails or in Washington, D.C. or on a military base. So this, many of the states passed these mini Comstock laws so that they could cover the same stuff within their state boundaries, within their jurisdictions. Um, one of the things to remember uh, is that these Comstock laws, obscenity laws, have made it easier to prosecute and censor sexual contents and other things one might find objectionable, such as violence or sexism or racism. Mm. Those things have First Amendment protections. Obscenity does not to this day. Mm -hmm. So obscenity laws were applied to broadly to a range of written and visual depictions of sex until modified by a series of court decisions over time, these resulted in removing a lot of materials um, mm -hmm. from the um, from the obscenity uh, statute. So, for example, contraception and abortion eventually got removed. But before that, uh, there were two consequential Supreme Court rulings, the Roth decision in 57 and Miller in 73, that actually said that there were ways that things we're not obscene like if they had redeeming literary or social value and so forth. So what happens is things like D.H. Lawrence and the Well of Loneliness and Henry Miller get excluded from the category of obscenity. And what's left is sort of commercial smut, the cheap, often badly produced stuff that you would find in the adult bookstores. Okay. Um, and then the Secret Museum, which is this wonderful overview, Walter Kendrick said something I thought was really insightful. He said the trend was toward widening the definition of the non-obscene and narrowing that of its opposite, which increasingly took on the label of pornography. Okay. Over a period of decades, obscenity was pared down yes. like Star some fleshy tea. fruit with That's an excellent. indigestible stone in its heart to lay bare what became known as the hard Quite core. Nice. Nice. <laughs> this is wonderful. Wait, wait, I just missed that. Hi and on. that hard core was what was widely understood. It's obscenity was pared down like some fleshy fruit with an indigestible stone in its heart to lay bare what became known as the hard core. Okay. <laughs> this is wonderful. Oh, and that hard core was what was widely understood to be pornography by the late 70s. Okay. The sexually explicit often... When is this? This is 5608. I'm not going to annoy you by going back over that, but I am going to probably say that quote and to check out that book for when I have my debate next week on Wednesday. So I apologize, but I did have to take that note. Let's keep watching. Crude, cheaply produced or reputable stuff that could still be prosecuted as obscene and which um, you had to sort of go to some adult bookstore, Times Square to get. Um, and there was another major group that was called Softcore, which was less, experience, less explicit and often better produced, especially as presented in mass circulation magazines like Playboy and Penthouse, uh, which were by then mostly immune from prosecution. And I remember T. Corrine, T. Corrine telling me the difference between hard and soft core. She said it's two inches, by which she meant no genital contact. <laughs> and that was two the, inches. you know, that was sort of the dividing line. Once Am I the only one that when she said two inches, never mind? <laughs> It's like nice play with words. Yeah, exactly. You know, two inches of avoiding genital contact. Not, you know, like the thing is two inches. <laughs> okay, let's keep watching. <laughs> it's happened over time, and Linda Williams has a wonderful piece on this, is that the notion of hardcore has shifted from explicitness and genital contact to kink. And that's part of what's happened over the last 40 years. But I don't have much on that in this talk.
Anyway, social conservatives were still bitterly opposed to porn, hard or soft porn. If you want to know about that, um, you should look, read uh, Whitney Strub's uh, wonderful perversion for profits, great account of the conservative opposition to porn. But by making it more challenging to prosecute uh, pornography, both the Roth and Miller decisions encourage more open dist distribution of porn and um, a proliferation of retail stores outside of the more traditional areas of sexual commerce. These, um, exp these expansion of porn shops provoked new forms of opposition and attempts to control them, which included, among other things, the zoning regulations developed by Detroit first, but which were then applied to such, uh, so effectively to cleaning up Times Square under Giuliani and new mobilizations of the right against porn, but also I would argue the feminist anti-porn movement. Mm -hmm. Now you need to understand that porn at that time was really different. There was no internet. Well, there was an internet, but the internet was basically government people and IT geeks on university campuses. I mean, it, it wasn't a public thing. There was no Nets, there was no navigator, no Netscape, no web, uh, no, gra no, no, no graphic interface. This was all mostly Unix and I don't know, Fortran and other things Unix. that I don't know. It's do. all mostly Unix. Um, so the feminist anti- Okay, you heard it from her, guys, on the internet then as well as, I mean, is it that different though today now? Is it mostly Unix today still on the internet? I don't know, a lot of people probably would say it's mostly horny bastards that are on the internet today. Circa the internet and what it's become. Let's keep listening as she tells us about why porn was different then, okay? The porn movement coalesced before even video recorders were common. I mean, they really sort of, VCRs were around in the late 70s, but they didn't really become a mass consumer product till the early 80s. The internet didn't become a mass consumer environment until the late 90s. This was 77. So most of the stuff that people are talking about is magazines and dirty books and uh, movies that you had to go to a theater to see or loops that you had to go to an arcade to see or um, uh, you know the sort of live entertainment strip shows and that sort of thing so it was a whole other different world um, this was also before the availability of personal computers which also took off in the early 80s as you can see from that leaflet which was clearly prior to computers the documents of this period were done by hand or on typewriters so the forms of pornography at issue were really different from what's available now, and um, uh, but largely as a result of the Roth and Miller decisions, uh, cheap commercial smut, smut and mass circulation soft core magazines were more visible and accessible than they mm -hmm. had been before. But you still had to like leave Playboy. home to get them. You couldn't just go to the VCR like or Playboy your computer magazine, what you're and about. get any of this stuff. Um, and it it was. Uh, in this period, roughly around 76, 77, that I became both aware of both the porn, of porn and the movement against it. Um, around 77, I met two lesbian f feminist photographers, T. Corinne and Honey Lee Cottrell. Uh, Honey Lee is very well represented in the gallery. Um, they, they were both uh, pioneering um, new forms of lesbian erotic photography, and I th think I have some of T's. Yes, um, just thought I'd show you a few of her photos, which I um, sh uh, have by permission of the T. Kareen Papers Special Collections and University Archives, University of Oregon Libraries. That's where T's material is. And this one, which has, it's called The Three Graces, has a lot of different body types. Uh, this one, which has uh, some disability imagery and this one, which is very famous and was the cover of Sinister Wisdom, made into a poster. Mm -hmm. And I think I, oh yes. And then Susie mentioned this yesterday, another of T's productions, the famous cunt coloring book. And I'll leave that up while I do some more talking. <laughs> <laughs> if I get bored, you can be distracted. Okay. If I get boring, <laughs> you can be distracted. Cunt um, book. Amazing. Anyway, they were the ones who first alerted Would me it? that there okay. was some feminist movement against pornography and they were worried that it might imperil Am I wrong for wanting to buy this book? <laughs> I'm sorry. I kind of want to buy it. I don't know why. It's so inappropriate and bad. There's no way anybody could ever see it in my house. Like, I'd have to hide it under, like, uh, in my drawer? Like, I don't know. But, I don't know. I think that's amazing. Let's keep watching. What was then a nascent genre of lesbian-produced and lesbian-focused erotica and of course, eventually it did. 
imperial event project. And I was just ignorant of porn at the time. I, you know, you just, as a, a female in that era, it was hard to actually see. We had a little store in Ann Arbor called the Blue Front, which is where you went to get like alternative newspapers and academic journals. And in the back, there was a rack of porn. And, you know, I never got to the rack because in front of the rack, there was this wall of the backs of the men who were standing in front of the rack. And it was like the Great Wall of China. You know, you couldn't get through the, the guys to get to the porn room. <laughs> It was like the Great Wall of China, all of these men standing with their backs turned, rifling through all the poor magazines. It's like the Great Wall of China. Why? Because they're all, well, because they're all hard as rocks. That's why, folks. That's why it was like the Great Wall of China, okay? Hard as stone. That's why, okay? St I don't know. I gotta stop, okay? I'm gonna, otherwise, I'm gonna say something horrible. Let's keep going, okay? Um,. So, um, uh, but I, so, but I, I began to be curious to what the heck people were talking about. And, uh, this was after those legal cases go, that opened up right opportunities Don't for do porn bad. stores Don't and downtown Ann Arbor actually had its own little tiny minuscule porn row, two porn shops. And upstairs there was a brothel. And later on, one of those became the gay bookstore. <laughs> this was about 30 years later. So I wanted to check it out, but I was kind of scared to go in. You know, yeah, there was a sense it was a place of unknown peril and something bad might happen. So <laughs> Laura Engelstein was in town. Laura is a Russian historian who used to teach her. Actually, she was teaching her at the time and she was visiting. So I recruited her to be my buddy and <laughs> go on an expedition to the local porn shop. So we, it all agreed and we walked in and nothing bad happened. In fact, nothing happened. It was a very ordinary place, aside from the wall of magazines with color photographs of naked people and visible genitals, mostly engaged in some kind of penetration. So there was the vaginal shelf and the, the you know, the anal part and the oral part and the interracial part. In the very back, there was some gay porn. I mean, it was sort of thematically organized, but, uh, <laughs> You know, so people could find what they were looking for. <laughs> uh, in any event, most of it was pretty clearly sexist and very poorly produced, but I didn't think the sexism was markedly worse than that of mainstream media. I hope that's not my phone. No, okay. Um, okay, first of all, she's a complete boomer, which is adorable, okay? I mentioned she's old. That's not a jab at her, but it is a reality. I'm something of a boomer myself with, like, technology, so it's fine. But... Is that true? Do we agree with her? She just stated that she thinks that the sexism that she saw in pornography at the time is not worse than the sexism that she saw in other forms of media. That's a claim. That's an opinion that Gail Rubin has here. Do you guys agree with that, though? Is that really true? I mean, I don't disagree. I'm sure you could find plenty of sexist images, like, throughout the... Uh, throughout the time period that she's talking about, and I'm sure that they were horrible. But I don't know. I think if we're talking about, like, sexism specifically during sex, because sex is such an intimate and vulnerable experience that you share, I tend to think that it would probably be worse. I mean, think about it. Like, if we're thinking about, like, sexism during the act of sex, what year was this? What year was this created? So, oh, you mean, like, what year? Well, I mean, well, according to this, this thing is, like, 1975. She stated this one year ago. So she stated this is, what, it's 2023? So she had this talk in 2022 is when she gave this talk. So I think she's talking about during the 70s pachydermis. I think that's what she's talking about. She's saying that, like, the pornography that existed during this time was sexist, but that it wasn't significantly more sexist than other portrayals of media at the time. And I don't know if I agree with that. I, I think that even if that's, like, even if we're talking about just sort of eye-rolling, you know, the zebra couch, you know, the, yeah, I, I don't know, yeah, exactly, political observer, that sounds more like a flavored opinion from Gail Rubin than a reality. I think that... It's hard for me to explain why it is. I'd be curious if any of you want to hop in the Collins, by the way, to talk to me about this. I'd be really interested to hear what you guys think, okay? But I don't know that Gail Rubin is right about this. This is a contention that I have with her. I don't know if a sexist portrayal of just a woman in, like, the kitchen, like, cooking up dinner for her 1950s, like, house husband 
is the same level of sexism as, you know, being brutally like mistreated like in bed, right? I, I think that those two things are a little bit different and I kind of tend to think that the latter is worse. That may just be my perspective. Somebody can certainly, I can certainly, in fact, let me go ahead and just drop the link to like the Discord and chat so that if any of you want to come in and battle me with your battle of wits, you certainly can. So let me go ahead and like click copy. I'm going to go now to the YouTube chat. Please give me a second. Do not go away. Do not go away. Please stay, please stay, please stay. Let me go ahead. I'm going to drop this in chat. If any of you want to hop in and tell me why I'm wrong, you certainly can. And I will bring you up here. But for now, let us continue to watch, okay? Let us continue to see with tea and no cookies because I've eaten them all. But I may get more. Who knows? Let's continue to drink tea and watch the rest of this, okay? So I was totally on board with the idea that there should be better, less sexist, more attractive, and more feminist porn. And a few months later, I was at the Waypam slideshow with my two students. And I realized that the actual anti-porn movement was not interested in better porn. They wanted to get rid of it all together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the case against that, porn, that and this is sort of the with. core of what I wanted and to convey today, it was so dubious that it still stuns me how quickly this became hegemonic and people believed it and really smart philosophers to this day believe it and are just worried about whether or not it's a speech act. I mean, that's what's going on as far as I could tell in the philosophy journal. Anyway, um, the slideshow, this is from the Waypam script describing the slideshow. This slideshow presents a spectrum of images which we consider pornographic. We consider pornographic. These images are found everywhere from books and magazines commonly recognized as pornographic to mainstream album covers and fashion photography. So already they've skipped from porn to something they consider pornographic. They range from the most blatant violence to the more subtly dangerous objectification. That's a really strange range of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they go on. Uh, some of the images were what was commonly considered porn. Other was, were just considered pornographic. And when I saw the slideshow, I was really struck by the variety of images, many of which were not what I would have thought were porn. So I wanted to know mm -hmm. what exactly made them pornographic. Was it the sex? The sexism, the black stockings and the garter belt, mm -hmm. the high heels. It was just really unclear what the criteria of inclusion were for this classification. And if point. I was going to oppose pornography, down. I wanted a better definition. I wanted a clear category, a, a clearer category than one based on images that someone considered yeah. pornographic. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that people consider pornographic, like, you know, the the, uh, the the social conservative right thinks all gay stuff is pornographic. I mean, this was a very loose definition. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the slideshow, that was my first question. The first one I attempted to ask, how was Wei Pam defining pornography? Yeah. The response was that question was not in order. Now that we had seen how awful porn was, the discussion. Okay, that's a big red flag right there. Okay, so how do we classify pornography? How do we classify pornography? And the answer is that question is out of order. And I think that, you know, just to sort of make this relevant for our modern day, because, you know, she is talking about the 70s. She is talking about, I'm sorry, I'm terrible at math. There's a reason I studied English in college, okay? This is like, what, 50 years ago? Like, what this is like, yeah, this is like roughly 50 years ago. Yeah, so... When she says, like, every, like there are the gay movement, you know, just books discussing, you know, gay sexuality or queer relationships are considered to be pornographic, even if they're not, right? Uh, we're experiencing this right now with books being pulled from schools right now that are considered to be pornographic when really when you pick them up and read them, they're rather milk toast, right? Um, and this is something as an English teacher that really deeply frustrates me about books that are considered to be pornographic, right? And then you actually read them and you read what it is that people consider to be obscene and it's just some of the most absurd things, you know? Um, like, 
uh, obscene language that's catcher in the rye, you know, that's, you know, the main character, whatever his face is, I hate that main character, um, saying, God damn it, right, like, throughout, throughout multiple pages. Um, the sex that's so scandalous, you know, it's the final page of the Grapes of Wrath, you know, where the female character is, you know, trying to embody the vision of the Virgin Mary by breastfeeding and saving a man dying of starvation, right? These are the types of things, and it sounds gross, and it is, but when you, but this is literature, okay? And I'm sorry, I hate to shock the masses, but most literature that you read when you go to high school contains things that are not written specifically for us so a 17 year old can understand what the meaning of a metaphor is. They're written because they're trying to embody and encapsulate the message of a nation, right? And so that's a good point that like she's bringing up, right? And it's something I think we should talk more about, like considered to be pornographic. What on earth do you mean by that? How on earth do we know if it's pornographic? Is, you know, Winston and Julia having sex in 94, 1984, is that considered to be pornographic? It's a sex scene. It happens. And yet millions of teenagers every single year are required to read it in high schools. But I don't think any reasonable parent would ban, walk that ban off of the book list. And I don't think any reasonable teacher would consider it to be pornographic. And yet we have to ask this question, how do we classify as something as being pornographic? What does that mean, right? I think this is like where the, the definition of the Miller test, like, and we'll talk about like the Miller test and obscenity later. Um, the Miller test is essentially a way to decide whether or not something is obscene or not. Um, and how that applies specifically to texts and what we consider to be pornographic. Yeah, but just as like a, as an English teacher and as somebody that teaches books um, at like in the high school level, it really bothers me when people say that because of how milquetoast so many of these books are. And yet, you know, they're, you know, it's just very frustrating. Let's keep, let's keep listening. It was going to be what we could do to stop it. There were in fact a lot of disparate images from album covers and advertising which was by no definition legally pornographic. Some of battered women showing their bruises and injuries. It wasn't clear why that was pornography. I mean, it was distressing, but why was this porn? It was violent. The connection to porn was left unexplained. It was just kind of asserted, and then they moved on. There were cartoons from the National Lampoon, text from sex manuals, an ad for breast enlargement, ads for makeup and scents, an ad for cellulite removal. Now, I find much of the so-called beauty industry deeply offensive, but it wasn't clear to me what this had to do with pornography. Mm -hmm. Porn, especially the softcore magazines such as Playboy, presented idealized bodies and no doubt generated pressures to use products and procedures to try to achieve such bodies. However, there was apparently no awareness that Hollywood movies and fashion magazines were at least as, as uh, responsible, if not dramatically more so, for the promotion of unrealistic Ex expectations for female bodies. Why was it just porn? I mean, all you had to do was look at some fashion show to see mm -hmm. these bodies that most people couldn't, and Hollywood actresses, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're unicorns, you know, they're extreme cases. Um, That's true. So again, there were, there were slides referring to Hollywood movies for other reasons of sexism and violence, but it wasn't clear what that had to do with pornography. There was a slide referring to alleged snuff films as if there were actually a real genre of films made of real murders, made of, to film real murder, murders of real women for sexual pleasure. There was no such genre at the time. I don't what? think there is now. Uh, and the original snuff film was actually a marketing hoax. It was not actually a murder of a real woman. Okay. This is the part of the, okay, marketing hoax. Original snuff film. Snuff film. That's another thing that I wonder. Is that true? Is there no such genre as snuff films? I don't know if that's true. That sounds suspiciously, I mean, that's something I think that somebody's gonna have to verify for me because I'm not sure if that's true. I mean, I'm sure that it's true. It's probably true that like the first snuff film that she's re referencing is a, it was a hoax. I believe that. There's probably like history to that that I'm not aware of that she might tell us more about. But the idea that like snuff films just flat out do not exist and have never existed and that there is no such genre that exists. 
I, I'm not sure if that's true. I'm sad to say it, but even if it's the case, okay, so it might be the case that there is no actual genre of women literally being killed um, on camera for sexual pleasure. Like, I don't know if, if, that's what she, if that's what she means, then that might be possible. I do think it might be possible that there might be films, however cr created, which portray women being killed, like the woman isn't actually being murdered, but it appears as though she's being murdered, and that maybe some awful people do use that. For, I, as I hate to say that, but I kind of think that's true. So I don't know. I think that's going to be a seedier part of this that we're going to have to find out about. But I'm not sure I'm convinced of that. Let's keep listening, though. It was a marketing hoax attached to a B-grade slasher film, uh, which Linda Williams details in a section in her book, Hardcore. Um, so, they, it, you know, what, what were the stuff movies they were talking about? There were a lot of images from what most people would in fact consider porn, the stuff sold in adult bookstores, but they were most, those were mostly kinky or extreme, a thoroughly unrepresented sample of the stuff sold in those bookstores. So at the end of the presentation, I also tried to ask why the examples of porn were so selective and why the sample wasn't more representative. I was told the only discussion we were going to have was what you could do to stop porn. That was the answer to everything. And that was really weird. Every feminist presentation I had been to up to that point in my life, you got to do a Q&A and actually challenge people. I mean, you can challenge me later <laughs> and probably will. But, you know, I, I just was stunned that you couldn't ask a question and get an answer. It was very weird. And these slideshows were indicative of the way in which the whole case was actually constructed. Skewed samples, arbitrary categories, and the suppression of dissent weren't flaws. They were features and they were pervasive features. So I just want to briefly <laughs> go into the logic course I took as an undergrad when I was trying to be a philosophy major. <laughs> and I don't remember how to do a real formal logical, logical argument, but I do remember one thing that they taught us, which was called the I informal time kingdom. Fallacies. And the informal I fallacies is something everyone should know about because they're- Hello. They're rhetorically persuasive, but they're not valid arguments. And there's a whole list of, actually, if you go on Wikipedia, there are about 300 of them now. When I took logic, there, logic, there were about 20. And it's a little easier to get the 20. But what I realized at some point is that the anti-porn analysis was a farrago of these fallacies. That's all it was. Um, so let me, let me uh, briefly go through what the, the, the major fallacies were. The first one is called hasty generalization. Okay, we're going to go ahead and just very briefly list these down so that we don't forget them for later. But that's something that I wonder about as I'm writing this down, hasty generalization, okay? I hear people making claims about pornography like this today, right? This is why we're watching this. We're watching this not just to get the history of it, but because these types of conversations are being resurrected about pornography today, like when people go on shows, when people discuss it, right? And so I wonder if a, we're having a similar problem today. She mentioned, for instance, a skewed sample size. Like she mentioned, for instance, the fact that when she was watching the slideshow at this presentation, that the kinkiest, most extreme examples of pornography were presented as representative of just this is what pornography is. And she's saying that this is not a representative sample of what pornography is. And I know that when I listen um, to talks today, let's just happen on the whatever podcast. I was watching, you know, start a stream. I was listening to like, I've listened to so many conversations about what pornography is and people, when they talk about it, they talk about some of the most horrible things. They talk about women, you know, um, being forcibly made to uh, perform oral sex until they throw up. They talk about like women being branded. They talk about women really being actually tortured on screen, right? They give extremely extreme examples of pornography. And these extreme examples are presented as representative of the whole of what internet pornography is, right? And the question is, is that it actually a representative sample size? Is that actually representative of what porn is? But then I guess there's a case to be made that even if there, so even if it's the case that 10%, right, of all of pornography is this horrible bottom of the barrel stuff, you could make the conceivably the argument that 
okay, well, maybe it's all the way down here at the bottom, but the algorithm, you know, it trains you from like the 90% of what you'll find in porn. You'll want to watch more and more of it. So you'll whittle it down to like this 10% all the way down here at the bottom of the barrel. I could see somebody making that argument, but I'm going to need to see some numbers that actually prove that to be true. Like I hear people claiming that I don't see the evidence for that. And so that's something that I want to have substantiated as well, like well, especially like as we're having these conversations about pornography. But anyway, so hasty generalization, that was the first problem that she found. Let's keep listening to the rest of it. Also known as cherry picking evidence. And that's what happens when cherry picking you evidence. basically pick examples or the evidence that supports a particular conclusion and avoid or ignore any evidence that does not. Yeah. So you start with a conclusion and then you just find the evidence that's going to support it. And you yeah. don't try to get a representative sample. This is one of the informal fallacies. And the anti-porn case was buttressed by focusing on the most, most loathsome and disturbing porn and treating those examples as if they were characteristic. Examples of more innocuous porn were ignored or there was no uh, and there was no demonstration that the more disturbing images were the most common. And in fact, they weren't. You can't conclude something about a group or a phenomenon from a selection of the worst examples or manifestations. That's how racism, frankly, works uh, and lots of other forms of bigotry. You just find some bad example and say all immigrants are criminals or something. I mean, that's that's the way those arguments work. So the fact that there was clearly sex is violent or object objectionable pornography, which there certainly was, was not sufficient to demonstrate that pornography as a whole was sex is violent or objectionable or that it was more so than other forms of media. Mm -hmm. So the first was this cherry picking problem. The second fallacy is what's called false cause, which is taking two things and asserting that one causes the other without demonstrating the cause. Okay, false cause. That's the second thing that she said, false cause. Let's keep listening to the rest of what she has to say. Uh, so uh, much of the condemnation of porn was premised on the assertion that it was responsible any number of undesirable social consequences, including rape and battery. The feminist anti-porn folks claimed that there was a vast increase in pornography over some unspecified period and a vast increase in violence against women over a similarly unspecified period. No statistics were given to demonstrate that there was even an increase, much less what the period was. So we don't know the time frame, we don't know the numbers. But nonetheless, they were saying, well, these happened at the same time. So clearly porn caused all this increase in violence. And um, <laughs> I remembered, uh, it's very easy to think that two phenomena that occur at the same time or in the same place are connected in some meaningful relationship of cause and effect. But coincidence and contiguity do not demonstrate causality. And my logic yeah. instructor explained this problem not cause. by using the example of the old story of the stork. I don't know if you've ever heard about storks bringing babies, but you're probably, many of you have not, but there was this idea that somehow, and if you go online and look for images of storks bringing babies, you will find hundreds of them. Um, so there was this idea that storks would come, land on the chimney, and a baby would come in the house. Well, the instructor said, even if there were a stork coming to land on the roof and build the nest, and even if a baby were born, it didn't mean the stork brought the baby. Yep. You know, you have to actually this is the demonstrate serial killer and that ice cream the claim example that this is a causal a connection. You can't just decide these two things happen at the same time, one yeah. or the other. That's one of the fallacies. The next problem, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll leave the stork up there. The next, this was made more challenging, mm -hmm. um, the, this cause, the, how these there were no adequate explanations for how these chains of causality were supposed to work, made more challenging by the construction of the category porn itself. As I yeah. noted, the term was not used consistently. Sometimes it referred to Playboy, sometimes to the contents of adult bookstore, Thanks, often to no all Mike. images that were Nosebleed either sexist Mike. or violent or contained images or suggestions of gender violence. And classifying all images of gender power or violence as pornography comprised kind of the third major fallacy. This one is what's called begging the question, which most people use without realizing what it means technically. It's used a lot these days to mean screaming for a question to be asked, but that's not what begging the question means in logic. It's a term of art that means essentially starting out with a premise that includes your conclusion. So you prove the conclusion by starting out with a premise that contains the conclusion 
we just use different language for the two moments. Uh, there's a Latin term for this, which I probably cannot pronounce, petitio principii, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the technical term. And, uh, but actually, it's, uh, it really means to assume the truth of what you're seeking to prove in the effort to prove it. You start out with your conclusion already in your premises. So uh, one textbook st states that this petitio principii is always valid. It's essentially a tautology, but it's almost always worthless as well. You're not proving anything. You're just restating something in different language. Uh, another term for this is circular argument. So circular they're argument. endemic to the anti-porn literature. The way in which it's operated goes back to my initial question about circular the definition argument. of porn, which was what was the category? If pornography is defined by, uh, by and the category is composed of things which one finds sexist or violent or objectionable, then pornography is by definition sexist violent and objectionable. And if you look carefully at the anti-porn literature, that's pretty much how it works, repeatedly. So, but if all porn is equated with sexism and gender violence, then it is even less clear what the specific role of sexually explicit media is in, or in adult bookstores is. And Alan Willis, in one of the very earliest critiques mm -hmm. of the then yep. nascent anti-porn rhetoric, called this tactic of slippery definition Hosh simply comment, quote, Mike. playing that's games with the English language. No one ever said it better. So those, that's really kind of how the, um, the arguments worked. And then if none of that worked, there was the fourth informal fallacy, the, the well-known ad hominem, which means attack the person. Yeah, so instead of arguing hominem. the point, you attack the character of your opponent. Oh, you can't believe what he says. He's just a scumbag. You know? can't believe what she says. She's not a feminist. She's pro-patriarchy. She's something worse, whatever it is. And that's what happened. Uh, in 1982, Robin Morgan denounced a bunch of us and asked how we dared call ourselves feminists. I don't know how Robin Morgan got appointed as the Pope with powers of excommunication, you know, but she seemed to think she had them. And in a 1990 collection based on this conference, the sexual liberals and the attack on feminism, they made a book out of it. Sure, there's a conference and then a book. Okay. T. Grace, Kathy, Kathy Barry, Sexual Susan Brown, Miller, Dwork, and, and Sheila Jeffries, McKinnon, Robin Morgan, uh, yeah, and, and Gloria Steinem. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, in the book that came out of this conference, Sexual Liberals in Tech and Feminism, here's what McKinnon said. Quote, the black movement has Uncle Tom's and Oreo cookies. The labor movement has scabs. The women's movement has fat. <laughs> so that's ad hominem. I mean, you just, it's a, you don't have to listen to their arguments because they're scumbags. So, mm -hmm. and uh, just so you know, this is the booklet that FACT put out called Looking, and it's a wonderful compilation of a lot of the arguments against the anti porn movement. At the time that this all happened, the anti porn argument should have been assessed and evaluated as was the usual procedure in the movement. Instead, opposition to pornography became identified with feminism itself, yeah. and the claims about it became ever more inflated. For example, in her 1983 book, Right Wing Women, Andrea Dworkin helpfully included some diagrams to illustrate what she considered the significance of both pornography and prostitution. Here we have the condition of women. Pornography, battery and rape and exploitation and prostitution. Mm -hmm. Or another one, Prostitution as the material reality, pornography as the underlying ideology. Yeah. And the third one, mm -hmm. pornography as a surface phenomenon, prostitution as the underlying system. Mm -hmm. I mean, this yeah. is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Just completely yeah. nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever happened to, you know, religion, private property, the state, the economy, lack mm -hmm. of credit, you know, all the, all the stuff we used to talk about, it's all gone. And what you see here is a narrowing. So that is a really good point that she's making as well here, right? That there is an overemphasis on pornography and it is a distraction from all of these other ways in which women are discriminated against and oppressed within society, right? Like, I'm sorry, it is patently ridiculous, right? Like as she's saying here, at least to me, we'll have to read more. We will get into Dvorkin and we will watch her documentary. We will discuss it, but just as a baseline looking at this to state that pornography, like to privilege pornography in such a way over actual prostitution, over 
you know, people who are almost certainly being trafficked, right? It's a wild thing to say. It's a wild thing to accept. And I think that this is a big problem, like, especially like when we're talking about, like one frustration that I have also is the overemphasis of us talking about OnlyFans, right? How many times have you heard about that? Like within these spaces, over and over and over again, OnlyFans this, OnlyFans this, OnlyFans, OnlyFans, OnlyFans. Guys, we gotta talk about this, okay? I don't know. My guess is the vast majority of people that watch porn or consume porn are not going to OnlyFans. And the reason for that is because the vast majority of pornography that can be accessed online, you can access it for free. Why would you pay money to for an individual creator when I have when you could have millions of like images or videos that you could literally click on and press for free, right? That's also another th thing that I think people should re also realize, right? A lot of people think that it's just easy to take a picture of your ass to put it up on OnlyFans and then you make millions and millions of dollars, right? Just instantly, right? Well, no, it's actually a lot more difficult to make money. There was this real, here, I'm gonna link this actually in the chat because more people need to realize this. Uh, let's see, wired porn industry. I'm gonna link this in the chat below, right? Yeah, it's, it, this was published like about five years ago, right? Um, the undying trope is that the adoption of new technology makes ridiculous amounts of money and dominates the internet. But it's not true, okay? So we're gonna look, let's look at this really quickly, like just to sort of give you, just to sort of give you an idea, okay? Midway through the second season of Silicon Valley, the HBO series that so skillfully spoofs the Bay Area tech scene, the plot turns to porn. Inside the offices of Pied Piper, the fictional startup at the heart of the show, a shaggy haired coder hacks into a rival company. The rival, he discovers, has landed a $15 million contract with a porn outfit called Intersight, also fictional, agreeing to build software uh, that will compress Intersight's videos and to send them across the net. Pied Piper CEO Hendrix, Richard Hendrix is amused. I don't understand. How does Intersight have all this money? It's pornography, says the guy with the highfalutin facial hair, right? Adult content has driven more important tech adoption than anything, says another colleague. The first fiction ever published on a printing press was an erotic tale. And from there, Super 8 film, Polaroid, home video, digital, video on demand, credit card verification. Also, just as a very brief, uh, on the printing press was an erotic tale. So I don't know if that's true. What I can tell you is the first, okay, Guys, the first novel that was ever written in the English, and I'm talking any form of English, an old English, English period, it was kind of an erotic tale, but it was not a, uh, it was not the, it was not a trashy romance novel exactly, okay? It was a romance story, which was called Apollonius of Tyre. Um, a lot of people think that like the first piece of, if you want to talk about the first piece of literature ever written in English, that would be Beowulf. But if you want to talk about the first novel ever written in English, that is Apollonius of Tyre, okay? And Apollonius of Tyre is a love story, but it's not really an erotic fan fiction kind of thing. That's, that's, that's just patently not true, okay? Um, I don't know if it's true that the first fiction ever published on a printing press was an erotic tale. I don't know what he's talking about here. What I can tell you here is that the way that that comes off, it's giving you an idea about literature that is not technically true, but I, I, I will have to like look that up just to be absolutely certain. I don't want to mislead anyone. But anyway, in many ways, this exchange is typical of the show. It's good for laughs, blah, 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 blah. Typically, the parody, you know, but Pied Piper's porn encounter is one of the rare cases where Silicon Valley gets things wrong. Typically, the parody rings so very true. In this case, it doesn't. In the popular imagination, the eternal trope is that the porn industry drives the adoption of new technology, that it accounts for some astronomically large portion of all internet traffic, and yes, that it generates equally enormous sums of money for all the faceless people who runs its operations. We picture these people as sleazy Southern Californians wearing pinky rings and polyester. Or, if we've come to realize the pinky ring character makes absolutely no sense in this age of the internet, we see them as ruthlessly clever business people with a sixth sense for where the big money lies. That's what the stereotype that Silicon Valley embraces. Later on in the episode where Hendrix turns up at the adult industry conference, we encounter an army of porn execs dressed like bankers. 
but it isn't true. It isn't like that at all. Some of it may have been true in years past, but no longer. A colleague of mine calls this a meso idea, an idea that has ceased to be true, but, people, but that people continue to repeat ad infinitum as if it still was. With the rise of mobile devices and platforms from the likes of Apple and Google, not to mention the proliferation of free videos on YouTube like porn sites, the adult industry is in a bind. Money is hard to come by, and as the industry struggles to find new revenue streams, it's facing extra competition from mainstream social media. Its very identity is being stolen as the world evolves both technologically and culturally. It's a world where Playboy is going PG-13 in print and online because it can't compete with the internet at large. Mobile and social media platforms have pulled us away from the openness of the World Wide Web and into walled gardens, squeezing the avenues for distribution of porn, co-opting its audience, at least in part, and forcing outfits like Playboy to become more mainstream. The larger porn industry is headed this in the same distinction, careening away from the stereotypes held by journalists and pundits and pop culture like Silicon Valley. That's obviously a fictional company because I don't know a single one that would pay $15 million for compression software, quips Chris O'Connell, who helps to run a real adult company called McCandy. The thing about the adult industry today, it's a very low margin business. And I'm not going to finish reading the rest of this, but what I am going to do here before I continue on is I'm going to drop this in chat, okay? I'm going to drop this in chat so that everybody else here can read this. Yeah, it gives the parasocial bond, the viewers, the creator more than anything. Right, but here's the thing, guys. Like most of the time, most people that are looking for porn do not need that. Most of the time, if somebody is looking for porn, they're looking, they, why would you pay for something when you could get it for free? You can literally get it for free. It's that easy. And that's the reason why the idea that it's this highly lucrative thing that you make millions of dollars, all you have to do is take a picture of your butt and put it up there. That's the reason why it's dumb. It's dumb because it, there are so many things that you can get for free, right? The way that these, if I don't know, and I need to interview like some more people that have worked with OnlyFans, I need to ask them about their experiences. But my assumption, my hypothesis is, it's probably a lot harder than a lot of people in these spaces give credit for making a buck on that site. Because they are competing with tons of images that are online that you could easily access for free. So the idea that it takes no skill, you know, that it's just an easy form of work, that's a very lazy thing to say, and clearly that's coming from people that like haven't really thought about what porn is, okay? When so much pornography is available for free, it makes it very, very difficult for really smaller creators and for smaller porn companies to be able to be profitable. There was a, there is a wonderful uh, documentary on Hulu. It's about the history of the nude, which maybe we'll watch at some time. And what it talks, no, it's not that. What is it talking about? I'm sorry. No, it's not that. I could be wrong. I will try to remember what I'm thinking of here. But essentially, what is it? What is it? No! Now I remember, okay? Do you guys know um, Jim's ex-girlfriend in the office? What is her name? Uh, let's see if I can find out who she is, okay? Hot Girls Wanted 2, okay? Hot Girls Wanted, Turned On. Okay, this is a TV miniseries from 2003. Okay, this was, no, not 2003, excuse me, 2017, okay? So this is a series that's on Netflix. I don't know if I can stream it. I would and we would react to it, but I think I'd probably get canceled if we did. But the reason why I'm talking to you about this is there is an episode here within this, uh, within this series. Let's see here. It was originally created by, the, by Rashida Jones. Uh, Rashida Jones, as you can see here, she is the person that played um, Karen Filippelli on the NBC comedy series, The Office, which is amazing. Sorry, folks, this is the, I'm at the tail end of millennials <laughs> and at the very forefront of Gen Z. So if you don't know what The Office is, you're missing out, you need to watch. But anyway, okay, so what the point of this was, this was a, the point of this documentary series was essentially to criticize the porn industry, okay? And it goes through and it interviews girls who work um, in the porn industry and it asks them about their experiences, about what it's really like to work within it, right? So. One of the things, but one of the first episodes for part two was this, the first episode, Women on Top, 
is about women's pornography and feminism in porn. It features, features Holly Randall and Erica Lust. In this, so essentially, this first episode it talks about Erica Lust and what they do speci specifically focus on is ethical porn. So they focus on uplifting portrayals of female sexuality. It's not brutal. They don't have the step sibling stuff. They don't do the thing where the woman is forced to perform oral sex until she vomits and is beaten and is called a dog. What they do is they create a very high stylized version of pornography that is meant to be uplifting and beautiful um, within their portrayals, right? And here's the thing, folks. These people are not making money, okay? These people, like if you watch that clip from that movie, from that like Netflix series, these people are just barely scraping by. They are barely scraping by. They are barely making ends meet. They are not rolling around in the dough, okay? And so I just wanted to give you that little point before we continue, because it's a point that I'm tired of hearing. Like, it's a very sexist and misogynistic point. People say that all oh, these girls, they think it's so easy to succeed. They'll just take pictures, naked pictures of themselves and upload it, right? Clearly, anybody who says that has not done any real research into what porn, the porn industry is like and what it actually le takes in order to succeed in it. So with that being said, let's go back and let's continue to watch this of the very concept of male supremacy to porn. I mean, there's no, there's nothing else left. It's just porn and prostitution. And since I had been marinated in all this literature in the early, early women's liberation that so exhaustively explored the causes and forms of gender subordination, I was flabbergasted, frankly, to see these diagrams and to hear people talk this way. I want to know where all the other institutions, ideologies and structures of gender stratification went. How did they get supplanted by porn and prostitution? And what was, what were we supposed to make of societies that had clearly, clearly had gender inequality, but neither porn nor prostitution, of which we know of many. Uh, so anyway, by the time Borkin's Right Wing Women was published, the argument over porn had clearly shifted. The first iteration was that porn caused violence. The second was followed by claims that porn was violence by itself. And eventually pornography was elevated to the primary cause of all of our problems of gender stratification. Just everything else went. And as I said, pornography became a replacement for male supremacy. Um, do I have time to say a quick thing about the internet um, and then conclude? I've got about three pages left. I, I'll just shovel through it. Okay, I know people need to go, but anyway. I want to conclude with a quick caveat about online porn. And the caveat is I have no idea because I don't do porn online. I mean, I am so computer IT challenged, I wouldn't know where to look for porn and I'd be afraid I'd get into some place I don't want to go and get arrested. So I don't even bother, you know, I just don't do it. Um, <laughs> so um, it's certainly true that porn now is quite different from the porn that generated all of these arguments 40 years ago, well, more than 40 years ago. Porn has gone online and I often hear the claim that online porn is especially violent and more extreme and more sexist. And since I don't go online to look at it, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But I am hearing the same arguments I heard, you know, decades ago about yeah. this. And I'm deeply skeptical that they're any more accurate now than they were then and for some of the same reasons. Mm -hmm. So one example is the claim that online porn is increasingly violent. Is it really? I don't know, but my suspicion is that, well, there's probably some really god awful stuff online. I bet there really is. It's probably as unrepresentative of the vast majority of what's online as were the selective images in the way pan slideshow, you know. Okay, that's gonna be something, if I ever have a conversation with somebody about pornography, that they are going to need to have to answer. They are going to need to prove not just that violent porn exists and not just that it exists as some caveat of the internet. They need to be able to demonstrate that it is a true representative sample of what, por what pornography is available. That's going to be a note that I'm going to have to hit hard on. I can be convinced if it's true, but I don't know if anybody's actually done that work. And I think that that's an important question to ask. Years ago. Um... I suspect, and this is sheer speculation, that porn online is probably as varied as it ever was, maybe more so. And actually, some of the more recent crackdowns on online porn that happened after these two federal laws were passed against trafficking, the pasta sesta laws, apparently fell more heavily 
on the good stuff, the feminist, the queer, the artistic, the inventive, mm -hmm. while leaving mainstream porn largely untouched. Yeah. So there probably is that that pressure on uh, online porn that um, uh, that does skew it somewhat. But I, I don't know. My other suspicion is that okay, that's something else that. She doesn't say this here, but she does say this in her um, in her essay, Blood Under the Bridge, which is a concern, and I kind of gestured to this earlier. Guys, big porn companies like Brazzers, they're not going anywhere, okay? They're going to stay. If real crackdowns happen, if like, if like, let's say like if tomorrow, like somebody snapped their finger and pornography was made criminalized, my suspicion is that it's going to be ethical porn sites that are going to be the ones that suffer. It's going to be people like Erica Lust. It's going to be people who like, uh, it's going to be people who create lesbian pornography by lesbians for lesbians. It's going to be smaller ethical porn sites, smaller companies that, sp that focus specifically in queer porn and specifically queer porn that is directed, created for queer people. That's probably going to be the pornography that is going to be snuffed out like that. But bigger porn sites, um, I mean, I should put this one qualifier, like there is a really weird habit online of where, um, as everybody here knows, right, gross portrayals of lesbian pornography, but through the male gaze, right? So it's lesbian sex, you know, for what men perceive to be lesbian sex, right? That's probably gonna be portrayed. So that's a concern, right? That's a concern about like about worrying and like obsessing over getting rid of all porn, right? Is that would it even be successful? It probably won't be successful. What would probably happen would be that ethical porn sites and porn sites that are legitimately trying to do work for good will probably be the ones that will be squashed out of existence. And that's going to be that's something I think that's a legitimate concern to have. But there probably is some really nasty stuff out there in porn land. But I wonder if it's any nastier than the neo-Nazi racist and male supremacist ravings that have proliferated online and in social media. If there's increasingly violent or loathsome porn, it may reflect less about porn than the tendency of online communication to drag almost everything it touches into some slimy pit of bottom feeders that seems to seem to thrive in the digital universe, uh, by which I mean well, I, I once heard a speaker observe that the comment section of news stories online was where hope goes to die. And I thought that's really, because after a while you start to get just, you know, the fascist and the racist and the nasty and the homophobic. And, you know, it's like people feel entitled because they're not actually looking at you face to face and they're hiding behind their computer screen to say this stuff in a way that's really kind of, it should be shocking at this point, I'm not shocked. Okay, so this is a point that I don't know I agree with Ruben on, okay? And she kind of alluded to this, you know, well, really, like, is, are really sexist things that happen to women, like, in bed sexually worse than, like, all the sexist things that happen to them on the street? And I, 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 I can't justify the feeling. My knee-jerk reaction is that, yes, I'm sorry, but I do think that that's worse. I mean, just to put it to you another way, right? Like, so we know, for instance, that race play is something that happens in pornography, right? So we know that there is a racist brand of pornography where um, essentially, unfortunately, the person of color, you know, the black person is humiliated for being black, right? And it's a part of the sexual encounter that they have with their partner, right? They're deliberately they're called all kinds of horrible, nasty names, right? And I, I would be interested to hear what other people's perspectives on this are. I think there is something uniquely and especially bad about that happening in a sexual encounter in a way that is not, in a way that is even worse than if you're just walking down the street and somebody is like just firing a racial epithet at you. I think the added layer of sexual abuse and the added layer of sexual degradation makes that much, much worse. And we can apply this not just to race, we can apply this to homophobic slurs, we can apply this to sexist slurs, we can apply this to, you know, being mocked for having a disability, right? Like in a, there's something about the fact that it is in a sexual context that makes all of these things much, much worse. And so I, she kind of is hand waving away, you know, the impact that that has on people. I, 
I don't know if I'm convinced about that, though, Chief. I'm not sure if I quite agree with that. Oh, I see a comment here. There is a hilarious Onion article about a porn star being fired during an interracial scene for saying the N-word. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's just, the, you know, it, there's so much gross stuff out there. Like, I, I just don't agree with Ruben here. I think that, I think that if you're being sexually abused and you're being mocked at the same time and degraded on the basis of you belonging to a marginalized group of people, whether that's whether or not you're gay, whether or not you're, um, you're black, whether or not you're a woman, regardless of what, fill in the blank for whatever it is, there's something about that that makes that much, much worse and makes it feel more humiliating and more degrading as opposed to somebody just, you know, I don't know, calling you a bitch on the sidewalk, for instance, right? Or calling you like, or like saying, or like a homophobic portrayal in a movie, right? This feels like, it feels too much like she's kind of hand-waving that away, which which I don't agree with. But let's keep listening. Um, but I'm wondering if the, uh, I leave the assessment, uh, I, I, well, I guess I'm wondering if online porn is any more immune to these tendencies uh, than political expression is. And if whatever is going on that's bad in porn is, isn't similar to what's going on elsewhere. And again, I'm not in that universe. I can't make a judgment, but I would just urge some careful thought about it for those of you who do know what's going on. Um, I just would caution against accepting the, the claims of the unique and special malevol malevolence, ah, sorry, malevolency of online porn without some empirical verification. Uh, which didn't happen the last round. I've heard all these arguments and assertions before, and uh, I just wonder, you know, if they're not being repeated. So just to conclude, there's way too much to do these days, too much to, prote to protect, so many fights to have, so much of what the feminist movement and other movements for positive social change have accomplished is endangered. But at least the stakes around things like legal abortion and transgender treatment and outrages at the U.S. border and the immigration, uh, the actions of the immigration police are reasonably clear. The issues around porn and trafficking have been less obvious uh, in their assumptions and impact, I think. So I hope I've at least been able to contribute to what I hope is an increasing skepticism toward the narratives about porn. And unfortunately, I didn't get to the ones about prostitution, but I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A that it becomes such a significant part of our current cultural and political landscapes. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I don't want to leave you. Yeah, I'm going to leave you with this. <laughs> this is the um, centerfold of the Barnard um, uh, statement, the pleasure and danger statement from the diary. It's more entertaining, I think, than more <laughs> elevating than uh, Dworkin's diagrams. Um, okay. And I hope as new voices and new constituencies try to bring back these sex wars and put such a positive spin on, on uh, on them that there is more skepticism about their claims and more careful examination of the histories and the programs that are being proposed. And I also hope that today and tomorrow we can celebrate something else, which is the courage, creativity, and brilliance of the ladies and butches and gender queers and others who decided back in the teeth of all of this prevailing antagonism toward erotic imagery in the early 80s, mm -hmm. that it was time to have a magazine for lusty lesbians and their friends, lovers, and comrades. Here's to you all. Thank you. Legitimately very cool. All right. We're going to end, I think, it's almost 11 o'clock, guys. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. We haven't finished our starter stream. Okay. Is there, let me just go ahead and check in chat. What did you say here, chat? I don't even consider that pornography. It's too focused on this. Well, that's kind of the, 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 the gist. And maybe this is a problem. Okay. This is something that Gail Rubin admitted to, right? She admitted to the fact that she is unaware of what online pornography is like, which is a fair thing for her to point out, right? But if this is what pornography is to Gail Rubin, it makes sense why she would feel as skeptical as she does of critiques of pornography, right? But I don't know. Like, I, I'm not sure. Let me just go ahead and see. Does anybody here want to talk to me? Anybody at all? If nobody does. That's fine. We will just move on to our ABBA song. We will sing our, very badly, our song for the evening. <laughs> and we will move on. 
there's anybody in chat that wants to hop on, anybody that wants to talk to me, give one last thing. Wait, Gail Rubin is scary. Am I wrong or do I have them all confused? Am I wrong or do I have them all confused? Uh, Gail Rubin is scary? Do I have them all confused? Who do you think you have her confused with, Allison? Who? Who? You must tell us, Allie, who? I don't know who you're referring to. At any rate, we will watch Dvorkin's documentary to contrast this to see, and I'll react to that too while, of course, playing my Stardew games. But if there is nobody that wishes to come in, we are going to end on a high note, okay? So this is, and I, I wanted to start with the Rubin documentary because we hear Dvorkin and Catherine McKinnon talked about way too much, right? So we, do, I wanted to have an academic perspective. The thinking sex person, yes, this is her. This is the thinking sex person. This is that person. This is the person who wrote that essay. She also wrote a follow-up essay called Blood Under the Bridge, if I'm not, con if I'm not mistaken, um, where she also addressed that there. So yes, this is the same person. Um, but why is Gail Rubin scary, Allie? I'm assuming that you're referring to, um, yeah, there, this is the other side uh, note about Gail Rubin that makes, sort of puts a really weird twist on some of the stuff that she says. She does have a moment in, it's either thinking sex or blood under the bridge and somebody can link the quote in chat where essentially she is like critical, like there's, I, I, I should find the actual quote actually, right? Essentially, like, Gail Rubin was critical of, like, the way that we, yeah, I've fallen victim to propaganda, LMAO, I can call in. Yeah, 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 call in, Allison. Here, I'll drop the link in chat again, okay? But I think I know what you're talking about. Let me go ahead. Do, 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 do. Yeah, no, please call in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let me go ahead here. Let me just drop the link in chat again one more time. Okay. I'm going to invite you, Allison. I just sent you an invite. I'm also going to post the invite again in chat in case anybody wants to pop on in, okay? But I think I know what you're talking about. You're going to talk about the comments that she made regarding pedophilia is, I think, what you're going to say, right? And legitimately, she does have some pretty gross comments regarding that. But there is something that she says towards the end. So hop in, Allison. Let's talk about it, okay? I know what you're going to say. Let me see if I can find the exact quote, right? So let me see, Gail Rubin pedophilia quotes. Yeah, she does have some rather concerning quotes, right? Um, and this is, let's see here, right? I think I know what you're talking about here. I know what you're talking about. This is a, an unsettling question raised by Gail S. Rubin's prophetic 1984 queer theory paper thinking sex. You know how they're pointing out they're teaching critical race. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yes. Queer theory. The defenders of groomer. Okay. Okay. May protest, but this is a dodge. Whenever you teach about it, say the gender bred person. Okay. So this is more of that kind of stuff, right? People like me have used the criticism. Okay. Thinking sex. Okay. So this is from the Wikipedia entry on thinking sex. I think, is this what you're talking about here, Allison? Allison, call in so we can talk about this. I know it, and this is, I think, what you're referring to here. So, in her 1984 essay, Thinking Sex, Rubin interrogated the value system that social groups, whether left or right wing, feminist or patriarchal, attribute to sexuality, which defines some behaviors as good or natural, and others, such as pedophilia, as bad or unnatural. In this essay, she introduced the idea of the charmed circle of sexuality, that sexuality was privileged by society was inside of it, while all, the, all other sexuality was outside of it and in opposition to it. So she's kind of giving like a Foucauldian like analysis of this. Um, the binaries of this charm circle include couple slash alone or in groups, monogamous slash promiscuous, same generation slash cross-generational. That's kind of a reference, I think, to child abuse maybe or like eight huge age gaps and bodies only slash with manufactured objects. So manufactured objects, that's referring to sex toys, like vibrators or dildos here. Um, the charm circle speaks to the idea that there is a hierarchical valuation of sex acts. In this essay, Rubin also discusses a number of ideological formations that permeate sexual views. The most important is sex negativity, in which Western culture is considered sex to be da dangerous, destructive force. 
if marriage, reproduction, or love are not involved, almost all sexual behavior is considered bad. Related to sex negativity is the fallacy of the misplaced scale. Rubin explains how sex acts are troubled by an excess of significance. Um, Rubin's discussion of all these models assumes a domino theory of sexual peril. People feel a need to draw a line between good and bad sex as they see it as standing between sexual order and chaos. There is a fear that if certain aspects of bad sex are allowed to move across the line, unspeakable acts will move across the line as well. One of the most prevalent ideas about sex is that there is one proper way to do it. Society lacks a concept of benign sexual variation. People fail to recognize that just because they do not like to do something, that does not make it repulsive. Rubin points out that we have learned to value other cultures as unique without seeing, this as, seeing them as inferior, and we need to adopt a similar understanding of different sexual cultures as well. So, okay, so, okay, for a century, so these are some of the lines, so these are some of the quotes I think that you're probably going to, for over a century, no tactic for stirring up erotic hysteria has been reliable as the appeal to protect children. The current wave of erotic terror has reached the deepest into those areas bordered in some way, if only symbolically by the sexuality of the young. Although the Supreme Court has also ruled it as a constitutional right to obsc possess obscene material for private use, some child pornography laws prohibit even the private possession of any sexual material involving minors. She then goes on to lament, the experiences of art photographer Jacqueline Livingston exemplify the climate created by the child porn panic. An assistant pro uh, professor of pornography at Cornell University, Livingston, was fired in 1978 after exhibiting pictures of male nudes, which included photographs of her seven-year-old son. And it ends with masturbating. Yeah, so there's some really cringy shit in here. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, this is, oh, you're backstage? You are backstage. Okay, let me see here. Okay, I'm so sorry, okay? Let me join you backstage, okay, Allison? Or backstage. Okay, do me a favor, Allison, if you can mute me on the thing. Okay, can you mute me on your YouTube video? You are live. You are with me. Hello. Hi, how are you? How are you doing tonight, dude? Uh, doing better than last night. Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, we're just watching this Gail Rubin documentary. Like, we're talking about the feminist porn war. So we're talking about Gail Rubin, Andrew Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon. And yes, we're talking about, you know, her essay, Rethinking Sex, where I'm guessing, like, that was what you were for. Is this what you're referring to here? Yes. Yeah. So I just have heard, I'll be honest, I've heard James Lindsay read Thinking Sex. Yes. And it is literally just him reading it. And I'm sure he gives commentary after, but he does read it through and through first, mm -hmm. like, 37 pages, right? Yeah. It's like several hours long. Uh -huh. In fact, I think, I'm going to abridge. I think he comments throughout. I think there's no way he just reads it, but he does read the whole thing. Gotcha. And it's 37 pages. And I literally looked it up afterwards because I didn't believe it, but it's real. But yeah, what you just read, like the, yeah. um, oh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the anti-child porn stuff is a moral panic. Just like how they said the gays are coming for your kids. Mm -hmm. Now they're saying the people who like child porn are coming for your kids. And yeah. like, obviously proposing those as equally reasonable is like yeah. pedophile sympathetic <laughs> like yeah no um, yeah i would agree with you there's some cringy shit here right and i and have heard of like some obviously of the framing of the seven-year-old it says the seven-year-old masturbating like yeah you looking at a seven-year-old boy touching his penis and saying he's yeah. masturbating like you're putting those sexual intentions on the child that's a seven-year-old boy yeah. you know what i mean like that's fucking mm -hmm. weird it is weird let's see okay let's read there's more here though okay like forensic sexual consuming okay well this is just going on this isn't more i thought this was more quotes from the actual text but yeah no and i think actually if i remember like in this like live stream, like I think that Gail Rubin, do you want to watch the rest of this with me? I think she actually addresses this here towards the, have you seen this talk before, Allison? Ooh, no, I haven't, okay. I haven't. Okay, here, I'm gonna go ahead and just play it, okay? Um, okay, let me pull up the stream again. Um, yeah, here, if you don't mind. Way. Yeah, I'm gonna go okay. ahead and, and if you don't mind. I'll mute on my end on Discord and then. Cool, okay, yeah, just unmute like when you're ready, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and play it. Let's listen to the Q&A. So, 
So we have time for questions. And um, if you have a question, raise your hand and Sean will bring you the microphone. Then you can, and Gail will choose okay. you. And um, <laughs> then you may speak. And I will also watch the questions that are in chat and, and read those for our, our visitors online. Guys, they're Thanks streaming so too. Yeah. They're being Twitch Thanks for streamers. I, you know, uh, brevity is not my strong suit. <laughs> we have a is it just me? I lost her. <laughs> you just you just oh, lost her. You just lost her? Okay, hang on. I'll unpause. Got it? Got it? The last thing I heard was her say brevity is not my strong suit or something to that effect. Yeah. Here, I'll, okay. I just paused it. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Hi, thank you. That was wonderful. And having been through around the periphery of that in New York, it's great to hear it from uh, a long view. <laughs> 40 years. Wow. I want to know what you think of all this crap about the the porn rings, the, the Hillary Clinton and the in the pizza gate oh, and God. the <laughs> I mean, is that related to this or is this totally well, it isn't, off? it isn't. Um, you know, I teach a course on what I call sex panics. And a lot of what we look at in that course is the emergence of certain uh, discourses around uh, sex offenders, for example, going back to the nineteen thirties and forties. Uh, some of the issues around kids and sex, some of the issues around sex work and, and trafficking. I was going to do all sexual trafficking, which I didn't get to do. Um, and what has happened recently, that stuff has already, it, it's been problematic for decades. And part of what I do in this class is that I, you know, we go through kind of how these things got constructed and what their effects were and how they fell on mostly like gay men and many of the other uh, problems with it. But um, I feel like it's sort of like all that stuff has been so weaponized recently. I feel like, you know, I, I open the, I, I get online or I read a newspaper and I feel like things have stepped out of my syllabus and onto the, you know, front pages. And it's it's kind of like, you know, anthrax is deadly. Yes. What's up? I have this, like, suspicion of this woman based on my, like, mm -hmm. just the red flags in this paper. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I have this worry that she's maybe, maybe intentionally, maybe not intentionally, but she's like leaning on a real and unjust thing, i.e. people like pedo jacketing gays, right? Yeah. Being like, oh, they're gay. They're probably a pedophile. Like, obviously that's abhorrent yeah. and terrible, mm -hmm. but I feel like um, that was like so unjustified and obviously wrong that like actual fucking pedophiles and like mm -hmm. pedophile sympathetic people will like weaponize that, right? And they'll yeah. kind of like... Yeah. Use that as a crutch. I think that you're right about that. In fact, I think that, like, like let me see. I think Nambla, let me see. Nambla, Gail, Rubin. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, I hate to click on this, but just to show you, like, I'm pretty sure that, like, yeah, you can see here that Gail, Rubin, like, I think that actually happened here, right? So this is Nambla. So for those of you who don't know, Nambla is the North American Man Boy Love Association, which is basically a pedophile organization. And here it has here, like this is like a quote from Gail Rubin here that was put up. You're right about that happening. So let's read this together. So youth liberation has argued for some time that young people should have the right to sex as well as not to have it and with whom they choose. The statutory structure of sex laws has been identified as oppressive and insulting to young people. A range of sexual activities are legally defined as molestation, regardless of the quality of the relationship or the amount of the consent involved. The recent career of boy love in the public mind should serve as an alert that the self-interests of feminist and gay movements are linked to simple justice for stigmatized sexual minorities. We must not reject all its sexual contact between adults and young people as inherently oppressive. So this was written by her in Leaping Lesbian, February 1978. So, yeah, I think the this is what I'm getting from, like, what I think is happening. Although some of the language, like, within this article is honestly, like, pretty disturbing, right? Like, I don't agree with her about, like, whatever this Jacqueline, what is her name, Jacqueline Livingston, you know, like, the assistant professor of Cornell University, like, that sounds, like, so over the line. Like, that sounds obviously like child pornography, which does make some of this suspicious. 
But what I think is the gesture of what she's saying and what she's trying to get across, which is what you mentioned earlier, Allison, is I think she's talking about like gay people being pedo jacketed and being pegged as pedophiles. And I think that is what she's reacting to. I think she's like, I think what she's trying to say is that she's reacting to the idea of gay people or queer people being pegged as child molesters or being pegged as groomers. Like this is unironically what's happening right now, right? And well, have you ever? Oh, sorry. No, no, no. What were you going to say? Have you ever heard somebody like very passionately call themselves gay, not queer? I, no, I haven't. What is that? Um, there's like a group of gays and lesbians who are. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's admittedly like kind of associated with gender critical people, but not completely. Okay. But they reject queer theory and they do basically believe that like queer theory is like a trojan horse for pedophilia and that it's basically like leeching off of like the gay rights cause which was like a legitimate civil rights cause right gay people were like seriously subjected to state oppression right like Mm -hmm. they were put in psych wards like gay men were chemically castrated um subject to like aversion therapies that's Mm -hmm. like psychological torture like yeah it i mean like terrible shit happened to them and, but I mean, they're basically one of the only, I think they're the only instance mm-hmm. of like a group making it out of the DSM and mm-hmm. achieving like social normalization, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's good. Mm-hmm. But gay people, these gay, not queer people, they say, listen, like <laughs> certain other motherfuckers in the DSM saw us do that. And they said, yeah. wait a second, you can get out of the DSM mm-hmm. with social activism. Yeah. And their like evil little gear started turning in their minds. And, mm-hmm. They say that they worry that their movement is being like hijacked, co-opted, it's co-opted. Being much more nefarious. I think if I could be wrong, I think that you're right about that, and I hate to make this reference. There was an episode in um, Law and Order SVU, and somebody can like find the episode that I'm talking about. It basically the episode was about somebody. It was about a pedophile who argued that pedophiles were a discriminated sexual minority in the same way as um, other gay people, as like lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. And essentially the entire point of like the whole episode was him like suing for discrimination, right? And like the politics around like pedophiles, like talking about themselves as if they were a marginalized group of people. We can even see this now, right? Like when we hear like people saying like map, minor attracted person, right? As like a way to sort of co-opt the group. There is something, yeah, yeah I, you know, so I think that you're right about this, but there's also another part of Gail Rubin's, the end of her talk that I think we should watch because she talks about specifically the history of child pornography and how it became illegal, which I'm really interested in, I think is like a good point. So I want to keep watching and I want to see what your thoughts are. Let's, let's keep listening to this. I'm down. Absolutely. Let's, let's, let's take a listen here. But when it's weaponized, it's worse. And I feel like QAnon has taken some of these already very problematic structures and essentially weaponized them. And yeah, this idea that Hillary Clinton was running a sex trafficking, a child trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., out of the basement, and it doesn't even have a basement, and people still believe this and want it investigated, it's completely nuts. And uh, I can't, I, it's not my area of competence. There's a book called Pastels and Pedophiles, which is about QAnon, which I haven't read yet. So I don't know, I can't say anything about it, but it's really, I, okay, go, I have it on my shelf. It's one of those, oh, <laughs> Susie knows it. Um, <laughs> but you know, QAnon is, it, all this stuff is kind of really amazing. And the idea that all the Democrats are, you know, eating babies and drinking their blood and, and, and running sex trafficking rings. And pedophile is now, it's like worse than communist or Nazi. It's, you know, it was really interesting. I saw Timothy Snyder talking about the way Putin uses Nazi and he says it really has no content. It's just everybody you, you can hate uh, and dehumanize. And that's how pedophile is being used these days. It has no relationship to pedophilia. It's just, it, just like the Putin's the use of Nazi has no relationship to Nazism. Um, and it, it, it's, it's even in people who should know better, like I saw Rachel Maddow do a really great segment on Putin's use of pedophilia and planning child porn to try to completely discredit people. Um, and she starts out by saying pedophilia is the most evil thing on, you know, that you could possibly imagine. Well, first of all, I think really a lot of evil things. 
There's a certain hyperbole that gets into this language, but beside that, she doesn't understand that pedophilia is not child molestation. Pedophilia is a diagnostic term for people with a certain set of emotions, and child molesters are not are often not pedophiles. So, so you know, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. But what are your thoughts, Allison? Well, here, wait, I want to hear you first, or I can go first if you really want me to, but I kind of want to hear you. Okay, so you know when people make a, try to make a big distinction between pedophile and hebophile? Oh, that person's not a pedophile. They're a, they're a hebophile because they're not attracted to an 8-year-old. They're attracted to a 13-year-old, right? Uh, I don't know. Like, I understand what Ruben is saying here, and it's not that she's technically wrong here. Like it Wait, is I thought she was doing, I didn't think she was even doing the pedophile hebophile distinction. I thought she was doing the um, pedophile child molester distinction. Well she, well, she is making that distinction. That is what she is doing here. Like that, but what I'm saying is that it kind of, it, even though that is what she's doing, she's making the pedophile child molester distinction, it feels to me like the same thing as when people make the pedophile versus hebophile distinction, right? Like, well, you sure, want to hear something right. that is a black pill to me, like, actually makes me, like, feel fucking sick? What? Okay, so first of all, you know, okay, under the DSM-5 system, mm -hmm. pedophilia is literally not a mental disorder. Pedophilic disorder is. Okay, so what? all of the paraphilias per mm -hmm. se were depathologized with the release of the DSM-5, and it said paraphilic disorders which are paraphilias that result in either uh, clinical distress or functional impairment, mm -hmm. those were pathologized instead, okay? The original DSM-5, you can look this up. Okay. They've retracted it since, but the original DSM-5 said, quote, it is possible to have a pedophilic sexual orientation without having a pedophilic disorder. Okay. What? So... That wow. was changed, but it was in there originally, can and you, you can look that up. Can you send me the link to this so I can read this? Because I, I might never actually heard have of this a copy. Before. Let me make sure the copy of the DSM five I have yeah. on my computer is the same one. Yeah. But I might be able to send you the document itself, like okay. so that you just know that I'm not bullshitting, and you can pull it up on stream and everything. Okay. Okay. But let me just make sure that I have that specific copy. Yeah. No. Go ahead and send it to me. I would be interested to read that because I've never heard of that before. That is very well. It was you no. Know, you understand, like the APA generally freaked the fuck out, and they were like, "Wait, what the hell is going on in paraphilia?" Because like, yeah. uh, the different DSM chapters are like different work groups, right? And okay. so like, it was a big freak out, and it was changed. Like, I mean, within probably a month of release. Okay. But um, that's not good. But the thing, but the why? thing is, they also tried to add hebophilia mm -hmm. to the uh, DSM, and they did it not because. They, like, Ray Blanchard was the guy who headed this chapter, and he said, I don't think it's, like, mm -hmm. particularly, just the problem is, like, the definition says prepubescent. So mm -hmm. he's, like, it's concerning because you hypothetically, if somebody's, like, very autistic about this definition, and they're, like, well, technically an 11-year-old isn't prepubescent, you could be missing a lot yeah. of the, like, sick motherfuckers who are attracted to children. So mm -hmm. he was, like, we need to expand this concept just so we're clear. It's, mm -hmm. like, really not that important whether they're prepubescent or prepubescent pubescent right the issue is whether or not they're attracted to children right mm -hmm. like yeah not fully revealed people that's the issue yeah and they couldn't do it mm. they couldn't do it there was a revolt in sexology they couldn't get it done to this day it only pathologizes strictly prepubescent attraction really? they couldn't do it couldn't uh, charles moser his whole fucking career mm -hmm. is uh arguing that the paraphilia chapter of the dsm-5 shouldn't exist at all and then also arguing for trans kids I'm not kidding. Those are the only two things he does with his fucking life. He's in San Francisco. But I'm just saying there's, like, some weird shit mm -hmm. going on Okay. in this area of, like, okay. scholarly work. Can you link all of that and put that in, like, general chat, Allison? Like, I want to look, because I, I don't know, I've never heard of any of this before. I don't know what you're talking about right now. Like, no, honestly, I went down, yeah. like, a whole rabbit hole with the DSM-5. Yeah. Let me. Yeah, link all of it oh so my that God, I can I, mean, I have it. I fucking have the copy of the DSM-5 that was released. 
that says, "Okay, uh, well, okay, I'm gonna like, okay, I'm gonna send this to you in DMs." Okay. Because last time I sent a PDF from my computer, it revealed my whole entire location to people. So I don't really want to put that in general, yeah. but I honestly, I trust you. You will be fine. So like, I'm gonna send this to Cross you. My heart. We'll hope to die. But. But no, I have it, and I'll okay. be able to get you the. Can, it's a big document. It's like literally the DSM five. What was so, the What was the you, Well, hang on. What was the revolt in sexology? Why couldn't they do that? Like, what was the argument against doing that? Was it just that it wasn't precise? Like, why? Um, it was seemingly an argument that I think could have invalidated most. Um, oh, your files are too powerful. The max file size is 25 MB. Your files uh, are too powerful. To Resubmit. Oh, wait, what? Oh, I'm, I'm making a joke. I'm, I'm making a joke about how powerful the file is. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> it does say your file is too powerful. I can email it to you, though. Yeah. Because I really do want it. It's literally on page 698 mm -hmm. of this copy of the DSM. That yeah, I have. for sure. Um, I In will... fact, honestly, I'll tell you how I got it. If you, like... Well, actually, I don't really. I, I got it like off of Sci-Hub, but okay. um, yeah, no, but for sure, for sure, send it to me. Like I can, I, I, and for anybody that's interested, send me your email address, like in Discord chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, um, and actually, I don't even mind putting it in the big chat because yeah, actually, you know what? Maybe not for now. Here, yeah, let me go ahead and just send this to you real fast. Okay, let's see here, because it's my at gmail dot com. So go ahead and send that to me. Um, Allison, listen, I really need to go to the bathroom. I've been drinking. I drank an entire pot of tea this evening. <laughs> and the thing about- Oh my when God, you, when you, your cute little teapot that you had. I know, it's so cute, isn't it? I love it. It's so adorable. I love cuddling it. Listen, I'm going to go to the bathroom, but I'm going to play Gail Rubin and I will be back, okay? I will be back. But okay. I'm going to play it for okay. the content. I'm going to email this to you and- Perfect. Yes, I'll like, try to pull up some other stuff to back up. I know I sound like a crazy person, I know I do, y'all. I promise. Like, I'm going to send this to Fairy Queen. She's going to be able to pull it up. We can, like, slow walk you through my, like, schizophrenic rabbit hole that I went down one day. No, for sure. Here, while you're doing that, mute yourself. I'm going to play this, and I'm going to go to the bathroom, and I'll be right back, okay? Okay. Cool beans. Okay, ready, set, and go. It's like a Venn diagram. Yeah, there's pedophiles, and there's child molesters, and there's an area of overlap, but they're really different things. So she was essentially you know, just kind of spouting this nonsense and then did a beautiful section on, on Putin. So it's very distressing, actually, to see the Pizzagate thing has morphed into a vast uh, online and social media discussion, you know, in which everybody you love to hate, including all Democrats, um, you can just call them those names. It's, it's quite, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, I've been trying to follow it, but it's actually proliferated so rapidly. Oh, and then in the hearings for poor Tangi Jackson Brown, you know, the truth of the matter is the child porn laws were kind of nuts when they were passed because they criminalized things like you could be 18 or 17 years and 11 months and 20 days, and that's child porn. When you hear the term, usually people think toddlers or babies, but actually the, the range of what's illegal goes up to, you know, the 18th birthday, at least in the federal law, as I understand it. And it criminalized things like nudity. So, you know, ethnographic films with naked kids running around are technically child porn. And I was just watching um, uh, recently The Godfather, and there's a scene in Godfather 2 where young Fredo is getting treated with cups for pneumonia, and he's a baby, and you can see his little baby peenie. And that's child porn, technically. And so, and then there's the whole story of Jacqueline Livingston, which some of the folks here at Cornell know all about. This woman who, photographer who was just destroyed by, uh, you know, because she took pictures of her kids, uh, which were, and there are a number of stories like that. There's Sally Mann, there's uh, Marilyn Zimmerman in, at Wayne State. These are feminist photographers who thought it was important to document you know, the real bodies of their children, but this is technically child porn. So the laws themselves started out kind of, you know, with a, a number of assumptions that I think were questionable, way too broad, and, and a lot of assumptions that never got questioned. But of course, they've become more and more intensified over the years. So for example, the original child porn laws, it was assumed that taking a nude picture of a child under 18 was itself a form of abuse. So it was the taking the picture that was illegal in the original, uh, the way the laws were written. Possessing it was not a crime. Well, now possession is a crime. And now 
these laws were written before the internet. So in order to possess more than one image, you know, you had to actually go out of your way. Well, now you can apparently download, you know, hundreds, you know, in a heartbeat. So the sentences have become, you can get harsher sentences for downloading some pictures off your computer than for actually murdering a kid. You know, I mean, the, so the sentences are crazy and the judges know this and they're trying to fix the sentences so they're a little more related to the actual crime. And so she gets raked over the coals for being one of hundreds of judges who feel this way about these sentences. So there's a lot, there, this is just an enormous area of, of uh, it's complicated and there are a lot of issues to, to sort through, but it's distressing that it's just become a kind of political weapon like weaponized anthrax. And uh, it's been injected into our political ventilation and hard to escape. And uh, it's, it's very distressing to me. I, I hope that answers your question. Hi, uh, I have a, a question from chat and mm -hmm. and I just want to share that comments are rolling in from the over 100 people who've been watching virtually. Mm -hmm. um, one question from Julia is whether you have any recommendations of books that get the history of the sex wars mm -hmm. accurately. And I'm wondering if mm -hmm. you could, we can um, promise to put that list of books, if there is, um, online when we share this recording? Well, uh, first of all, there's Pleasure and Danger, which has got the, a lot of the accounts of what happened at Barnard. And the second edition has a separate piece by Carol that was also printed in a law journal. Uh, it was printed elsewhere, kind of, it's called More Pleasure, More Danger, I think. Uh, so those two are very good about Barnard and the events at Barnard. Uh, Lisa Dugan and Ann Hunter have their book, The Sex Wars, which has a lot of great stuff in it, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of you know, terrific commentary. It's a wonderful book. Um, the Carolyn Bronstein book on the porn wars is mixed. The first three chapters are basically saying, trying to rationalize why the anti-porn movement came about by looking at the, mm -hmm. the, the 60s. And they're based on secondary literature and they're sort of, I think, a skewed reading of, of, of that literature. Okay, let's go ahead and pause this. I see that there's a question in chat. So Okay, there was a whole controversy during the Ket Angie Brown Jackson's nomination hearing. I actually don't know who that is. I need to Google and find out who that is. I don't know who that is, Pachydermis. Is that somebody who was convicted of child molestation? Is that who that person is? No, 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 no. no. Ketanji Brown Jackson, Supreme Court Justice, Biden's nominee. Oh, um, oh, okay. I'm just yes, dumb. Okay. Um, so she was. Um, Basically, so Gail Rubin was lamenting, this is, I'm guessing, a very modern speech of her because she seemed to just reference the Katanji Brown-Jackson nomination, right? Okay, gotcha. Wait, is this a real, like, a recent speech by Gail yeah. Rubin? Yes, this was published, like, about one year ago. This was published one year ago. So Gail Rubin basically seemed to make the argument that, like, first of all, Anything can be child porn. You can have a picture of a child that's just like a little bit naked and it can be child porn, which like, mm -hmm. God, I haven't rushed up on my fucking child porn statutes recently, but it, I'm pretty sure it has to be intended to arouse. So it has okay. to be like sexually exploitative in nature, like a photograph of a child wearing mm -hmm. a diaper just because it's like a family photograph and the kid is wearing a diaper. Like, obviously this isn't intended to arouse. Like, this right. is like, I think like... Uh, when when people are like, oh God, it's just so hard to tell when a picture mm -hmm. is child porn or when it's a picture of a kid. I'm like, mm -hmm. you might be a fucking pedophile, bro, because it it seems like okay. it's actually not that hard, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm already a little mm -hmm. bit suspicious of this person, but anyway, she's like, what what is maybe a little bit different? Yeah. She says, um, these the thing is like possess, which I don't know how bad I feel for him, right? But mm -hmm. basically, possessing child porn, like it's per image, right? Every count is per image, mm -hmm. so you can have like hundreds of charges of the same felony you yeah. have like right so mm -hmm. these people can be looking at like very intense mm -hmm. prison sentences right. for they would say stuff that we feel really really gross about but it is a victimless crime they didn't harm a person mm -hmm. right which i'm like i don't care <laughs> you know what i mean like put them away right like yeah. i i personally like i'm not losing any sleep over it right but like mm -hmm. i get it where people are like mm -hmm. um you know, it's a lot for consumption right. of images, yeah. right? Like, mm -hmm. it is a lot for consumption of images, but it's, like, really, like, a thing mm -hmm. that we regard as very disgusting in society. So it's, like... Yeah. But Katanji Brown-Jackson is one who seemingly was, like, 
perturbed by, I mean, like, anti-incarceration people generally, people mm-hmm. who think prison is, like, torturous, these mm-hmm. people are obviously more reluctant to, like, yeah. hand out, like, 70-year mm-hmm. prison and sentences for consumption of images like even yeah. if we find it despicable mm-hmm. right like so this is kind of because Katanji Brown Jackson has said things to mm-hmm. that effect like either in opinions mm-hmm. or because she's been like lenient with sentencing in the past there were right wingers mm-hmm. who basically tried to paint her as pedophile sympathetic like during her nomination process which I think was I didn't look into it too deeply, but it seemed probably pretty very much unfair. She doesn't mm-hmm. seem like a pedophile, okay? Mm-hmm. It does, it's not like she was giving these people no sentences, right? Mm-hmm. She was knocking it down like, I mean, I could be wrong, but it seemed like it was going from like a 25-year okay. sentence to like an 18-year sentence, right? It's like these people are still going away for a long time. Mm-hmm. I think it's fine to be... Mm-hmm. Th- we treat... Um, I don't, I don't know how much I want to go into this rabbit hole. I'm not trying to just completely take over. But there's some okay. interesting constitutional arguments regarding, like, the way we treat sex offenders in mm-hmm. the criminal justice slash psychiatric mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. And I'm, like, kind of on the more, like, I'll admit it, like, authoritarian, like, side, which makes me sound like a conservative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't think I am generally. But I'm just, mm-hmm. like, with this, like, mm-hmm. it seems like it is so hard to convict child abusers of the actual crime because Mm -hmm. beyond a reasonable doubt it's just so hard convicting sex crimes is like so hard Mm -hmm. and when the eyewitness is a child it's just like it's a real uphill battle so like yeah yeah, the child porn itself might not be like the material harm itself it might be disgusting but Mm -hmm. i don't care if it's how we get them it's how we get them Mm -hmm. and these same things with the Mm -hmm. civil commitment laws yeah like People will argue for the abolition of the paraphilic disorder chapter because most states have a, like, sexually violent offender law where Mm -hmm. you can be committed to a psych ward for your paraphilia if it's unmanaged or your Mm -hmm. paraphilic disorder if it's unmanaged. Mm -hmm. And, like, you can be committed to a psych ward right after you're released from prison. You can go to from Mm -hmm. prison to the psych ward and it doesn't violate double jeopardy Mm -hmm. right and there are people who are like that's a constitutional problem you're treating these people as different Mm -hmm. and then there are other people who are like yeah they're pedophiles we are treating them differently Mm -hmm. well i've heard some people i remember i was in a i was in a course in my graduate program where we were talking about rehabilitation in prison so this is a take that i have i haven't like really divulged it or tried it out with somebody but i plan to which is that i am not for rehabilitation in prisons. Um, I am actually, I am actually pro, um, what is the term? It's not restorative. Like, I, I think that like- Retributive is punishment. Retributive, yeah, I am more pro retributive. And one of the things that I've always hated, and it has specifically to do with this topic, which is I've heard some people say, you know, really, you know, sending like somebody who's been convicted of child molestation, that's the, the prison is the worst place for that person to go because that person might get beaten up and that person could be killed, right? And this is a piece about going to jail that more people need to say. Part of the punishment of going to jail is that you are surrounded with the other people who are in jail, right? I, I've always found that argument to be never like rhetorically convincing, right? Like the all like logically, I like the the way that you can handle that is by creating a specialized ward and a separate ward where that person is taken away from the general population so that they aren't brutally massively killed by anybody else like within the major population. But it's it's always like sort of rubbed me the wrong way. I will say the one thing that Ruben says about this that I do think, well, a couple of things, right? So number one, is she right about the statues? Is it true that like if you had like the Godfather and you watched it that you could go to jail for like watching child porn? I don't know if that's true, right? And I don't know if that's true because I don't know how many people, because if that's true, then that means that there should have been sort of some sort of case law. There should should have been some sort of uh, accusation of that in court. I wonder if that's well, the case. Well, they say there's a difference between, like, facial constitutional challenges mm-hmm. or, like, well, facial facial challenges, like, on its face, like, it's clearly unconstitutional. But, like, there's a difference between, like, 
the statute could be applied this yeah. way versus like the statute is being applied this way. Yeah. So they would say something to the effect of like, no, you probably won't find a single case mm-hmm. where somebody goes to jail for child porn because they watched The Godfather or whatever. Yeah. But the fact that that's even a question is fucking draconian. And these obscenity laws are just so anti First Amendment. <laughs> like, and yeah, then they go into their whole thing. And I'm just like, yeah. you know, it, it seems like if we like try to whittle down the law so much like we can trust the courts to be reasonable we can Mm -hmm. trust the courts to be baseline reasonable you know objective reasonability like so many statutes like just have the word reasonable in there Mm -hmm. and basically the appeal is like we're just object we're appealing to the Mm -hmm. like objectively like hypothetical reasonable Mm -hmm. actor right and like Mm -hmm. that's like hard to pin down but it's a fine concept we know that the objectively like hypothetically perfectly perfectly reasonable actor isn't sending a motherfucker to jail for Mm -hmm. the godfather so we can trust that the average american court will not do that even if the law Mm maybe like if you applied it in this like really stupid way could do it so that's a really good that's some people i just think some i don't mean to be paranoid but it seems like some people have ulterior motives and so they that's true like gail rubin She's talking about sex panics. She's mm-hmm. talking about QAnon. She's talking about, I mean, I'm sure she's talked about the satanic panic before. Yeah. There are absolutely, like, instances of societal hysteria about mm-hmm. child sex abuse. Like, that yeah. is real. But then actual people who seem, like, sympathetic to pedophiles will use those, like, yep. histrionic cultural mm-hmm. moments we have to mm-hmm. imply that all concern, like, for safeguarding is, like, yeah, is, is wrong. And the other problem with it, too, is that she just, that some of the stuff that she says here is, like, clearly just bad, right? Like, I mean, like, when she, like, if we go back to, like, the quote on the NAMBLA page, that's bad. Her defense of Jacqueline Livingston, I don't buy that. I just don't. I, and I don't think that you can, like, justify that as simply being, you know, a naked picture of, like, a little boy in a bathtub. This is not, this is not that kind of picture, right? Clearly, right? Like, from the description. Yeah. It's, uh, it, like, literally at my house, there's a picture of me and my sister when we were kids in a bathtub. Because yeah. we had all these, like, we had this whole, like, elaborate, like, bathtub setup, okay? Literally nobody in their right mind ever thinks that that's fucking child porn right yeah. like that is not like so the fact that this woman's pictures mm-hmm. of her son the fact that they got tricked as, or like triggered as child porn mm-hmm. right and the fact that she's like in this like sociology like i'm sure she probably was doing some sketchy shit is all yeah. i'm saying like i haven't seen these pictures i'm not interested in seeing them yeah. like i don't want to end up on a fucking watch list right but all i'm saying yeah. is like People take pictures of their kids all the time, mm-hmm. and they don't get flagged for child porn. So, like, yeah. what was this woman doing? Mm-hmm. Like, and why is this, like, freaky-ass woman defending mm-hmm. her pictures of her son that she's labeled as masturbating? Yeah. Which, again, like, I reject that, right? Like, yeah. um, That's it, the and it, oh, oh, like. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's just bad stuff, I, honestly. And <laughs> it's, it, and it calls into question, too, like, because our, our whole point of watching this, right, is she's trying to, like, make a critique of Andrea Dvorkin's critique of pornography, right? Like, she is trying to give, like, the reasonable scholarly response, right, to what Andrea Dvorkin and Catherine McKinnon's attacks and ordinance against porn were, like, in the 70s, right? And so the question is, right, are her comments regarding pedophilia and are her comments regarding child porn, are, is the fact that her quotation is right there on the NAMBLA website, does that cast a pall on all of the other stuff that she said previously regarding pornography in general, right? Like, I even mentioned earlier that, like, it really seems like she's hand-waving away, like, the sexual degradation aspect. I don't know if I buy that. I, I, it seems as though, like, she's hand-waving something away that most that the general population probably would consider to be a big deal. What do you think? I I, I don't know. I just get I am not as well versed in feminist theory as you are. I know the very bare bones of what Dworkin and McKinnon had to say, right? I yeah. mean like the just the barest of bones, okay? So I don't know if I'm like in a place to actually evaluate like Ruben's criticism of their work, but yeah. it just does seem like she's defending some actually sketchy shit, yeah. namely Nambla, whatever these photos were of this woman's seven year old's like son that she billed as yeah. him masturbating. Yep. Um, she's defending this and she's comparing it to like 
more reasonable stuff like, yeah. oh, we shouldn't pedo jacket gays. Yeah. Oh, we shouldn't have cultural hysterias about child sex abuse. Mm -hmm. Everybody can get on board with that, right? But then you try to sneak in the shit that nobody wants to get on board with, mm -hmm. with the like really agreeable stuff. And mm -hmm. like, I'm raising my eyebrows personally. No. Um, but what I've heard people say a lot when I start worrying, like, when I start hearing people be like, it's really important that we distinguish between the pedophiles and the sex abusers. Like, yeah. okay, I, I get it. But the thing is, like, um, pedophilia is, like, very well predicted by child porn consumption. Like, fucking obviously. Like, right. they use the phallometric tools or whatever where they put, like, a dick sleeve on them. And, like, it's so gross. Like, measure, like, erectile, like, issues. Mm. And, like, what do you know when people are aroused by child porn, they have a pre like they have a propensity for arousal at children. Like, what yeah. do you know? Like, that's like an obvious statement. Yeah. Right. That um, people would say that just so consuming child porn is like very predictive of whether or not someone has like pedophilic yeah. inclinations. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's not necessarily predictive of whether or not they're actually going to like yeah. physically violate a child. Mm -hmm. Right. But because, and so but because I always, but to me, I don't really care i just don't really care because i feel like it's just yeah. good for the level of tolerance we have for this as a society to be at like a right negative to you and you know and you know it's something else too right like i i have always hated the destigmatizing pedophilia so that pedophiles can get the therapy that they need discourse i think that the people who say that have done I'm really curious to know, like, what research they've actually done into what therapy models are actually available for pedophiles. I, I actually did that for an abuser panel that I did, like, months ago, okay? And what I was able to find was pretty abysmal, to be perfectly honest with you. Like, like if you actually look at, like, the therapy that child molesters and pedophiles actually have to go through, like, there's one model that's called the Good Lives Model, where essentially it's the most positive model where they try to find, like, the best things about a pedophile's life to try to seek fulfillment in the best way possible to be happy, which is one model that they use. Usually, typically speaking, at least from what I was able to find, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is something that's typically used. And here's the reason why that's important. Like, there's a wonderful article from Times Magazine that talks about, like, what some of these therapy sessions are like. You are required to take responsibility for your actions. CBT is not lying on the couch, right, where you talk about your terrible childhood and your feelings and, you know, it's not like Dr. Melfi and Tony Soprano, right, like where your dreams are like, it's, that's not what it is, okay? CBT is where your thoughts are being challenged, right? It's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's therapy that is supposed to challenge your way of thinking. That's the therapy models that are typically used with people who are pedophiles. It's meant to challenge previous assumptions, right? So it's just not the case. And even post afterwards, like, like I know like if you actually look at the therapy models, it doesn't actually seem to me to be the case that, that they really have good predictive outcomes or that they're really effective. Chemical castration seems to be like the most effective thing that's available. And here's another thing too that I've always wondered about this. And this has to do with like the Catholic church, right? There was probably no institution on the face of this earth that wanted the idea that we could take somebody who is a pedophile, send them to therapy, the therapy that they need, and that they could come out the other end and they would be completely sane and good, for, sane is probably the right word, but safe to be in society, safe to be around children afterwards, right? That we could really rehabilitate that. There were so many priests who were sent to therapy, who were sent to counseling, who were sent to spiritual guidance, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the fact of the matter remains directly after that counseling, they were immediately placed back into dioceses and parishes with children, working with kids. And we know what happened. What happened was many of them did reoffend. We know that like, despite huge emphasis on the importance of forgiveness, on the importance of rehabilitation, on the idea that, you know, all sins can be forgiven through God, that this wasn't sufficient to solve the problem that existed, right? There is probably no bigger example of, like, the failure of the idea of rehabilitation. Like, it's just simply not the case. From what I understand, from what I have seen, asking and trying to rehabilitate, like, to a pedophile, it's like trying to send, like, 
And I hate to say it in the same way because we did mention like pedo jacketing, like is like talking about gay people, right? But in this oh, sense, I'm gonna have the best segue after you say what you're gonna say. I promise. Yeah, it's gonna be yeah, a but a it's a like, but in this sense, like you can't convert somebody who's gay into being straight, and you can't convert somebody who's a pedophile into not being a pedophile. Sadly. Have you ever heard of? I'm so sorry. I'm so excited to like because okay about I've pedophilia. Heard, that's what we're talking about. Well, no, no, no. Because I, Fairy Queen, I'm so fucking freaked out by this, and I literally sound yeah. like the like Charlie with the meme with the like map. Like, hey, there's like freaky shit happening. Like, I don't know if it's like bad or not, but like, mm-hmm. I'm worried. Like, okay, uh, do you know who Dr. James Cantor is? No, I've never heard of him before. I don't know who that is. He is the. He at least at one point was the edit of the scientific journal called Sexual Abuse, okay? And he was a mm-hmm. big sexology guy at the Toronto Clinic. Okay. Um, like the CAMH, like Toronto Sexology Clinic, where they did like a lot of phal- phalometry studies, like mm-hmm. with the dick sleeves where they measure the erectile stuff. Yeah. And he is, all, I mean, he sounds kind of religiously convinced that it is a sexual orientation. They cannot change. It is in their brain Mm -hmm. from birth. They are born pedophiles and it is a sexual orientation. And, um, it's not one that we we should normalize, but it's a sexual orientation that cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. And the way you prevent abuse is by getting people to accept that they have to live a life of voluntary celibacy. Mm -hmm. Like, and I hear that and I'm like, okay, I, I'm not going to pedo jack at James Cantor, okay? A mm-hmm. lot of people do because he does explicitly say, like, mm-hmm. we should advocate for pedophiles. Along, He's done advocacy with virtuous pedophiles, if you know mm-hmm. what that organization is. No, like, a number of, like, red flag organizations. But mm-hmm. I do think he genuinely, like, wants to prevent child sex abuse. I think that's – I'm not trying to, like, mm-hmm. make him out to be, like, yeah. this bad guy. Yeah. But he does have this – I mean – I don't know. Maybe I just don't want to believe it, right? But I'm just mm-hmm. like, do we know enough about the human brain? Like, do I'm like so skeptical of neurology stuff. Like, well, I, I, th- I think I obviously don't think we can like assume that it can be treated, right? Like, so so far as like we can't mm-hmm. leave these people out. It seems like the way mm-hmm. to treat it is just to eliminate their sex drive, right? <laughs> to do chemically castrate yeah. them, make them not able, like engage in any kind of sexual activity at all, because it seems that you can't. Yeah. change their like sexual target but i just i don't know i james cantor i believe that he's a good guy because he was one of the people who wanted to pathologize hemophilia mm-hmm. he wanted to expand diagnostic mm-hmm. criteria to include people that were attracted to pubescent children but mm-hmm. also fair and clean i found the main argument for why they didn't do that and they said it's because they think that all men are attracted to uh, their hemophilic. So it's not a paraphilia, so it shouldn't be in the DSM. Jesus that was literally Christ. the main argument. That's awful. Can and you link that, please? Can you DM that to I me? I actually already sent you, I think, okay. Dr. Ray Blanchard's dissent from the like mm-hmm. pedophilia, pedophilic mm-hmm. disorder um, entry in the DSM-5. Yeah. And I sent you the copy of the DSM-5 that had pedophilic sexual orientation in it. Okay. Okay. My theory is that there are some fucking perverts in sexology, guys. This is what I'm getting at. I think there are some fucking weird freaks in this, like, one specific area of medicine. And I think they're doing some weird shit. And that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Well, that's well. thank you for linking it. I honestly, I need to read it over just to sort of get the grasp of it um, before I can really give any comments on it. But it does sound pretty gross as you're discussing it. One thing I would say, and I would need to read it just to be more aware of it, right? Sexual orientation, like, to even refer to it as that is, in and that of itself, feels like a, a way of normalization, doesn't it, right? Like, I think that, like, I've read something from Blanchard before, which essentially states that paraphilias aren't something that you can really change, right? And this doesn't even just apply to pedophilia, like, this applies to, this applies to I other undesirable Blanchard forms of sexuality. I think Blanchard uses the definition of paraphilia that it is just an abnormal sexual orientation. Well, I could well, be wrong. well, well but then right. why is pedophilia not a paraphilia? Like, that's, I think, my question, right? Like, would that not oh, fall? Pedophilia, well, no, they would say it is a paraphilia, but that paraphilias aren't necessarily mental disorders. 
but that paraphilic disorders are necessarily mental disorders. But they wouldn't deny that pedophilia is a paraphilia. Some of the fucking freaks would deny that hebophilia is a paraphilia. I see. They would say mm-hmm. it's normal. Mm-hmm. Most people, if you measure mm-hmm. the like philometry mm-hmm. results, they don't. Um, they're not distinguishable from like pedophile controls, right? So yeah. the gin pop isn't so different from the pedophiles after all. This is what these like Charles Moser. If you look up Charles Moser, I don't he, know who that is. you can look up his like uh, what's it called, where it just lists all the papers they publish, and mm-hmm. you'll see most of them are about. We shouldn't have a paraphilia chapter in the DSM-5 at all. Um, It's, like, really fucked up that we psychopathologize any mental, like, any sexual uh, preferences whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And he'll say, like, yes, I also believe in completely eliminating, like, pedophilia, pedophilic disorder from the DSM. But, of course, child sex abuse would still be criminalized which is true, child sex abuse would still be criminalized, but Mm -hmm. one of the major ways that we keep pedophiles out of the public is with these sexually violent offender laws, Mm -hmm. which require a psychiatric diagnosis to have someone committed to a ward, right? So that's, I think that's why they want this chapter gone, because I don't think they want these laws, which are contingent upon the existence of these mental illnesses, I don't think they want these laws to exist. I don't think, I think they want it to be harder to put these people away, basically. Here's a question, too. Like, I have heard, like, speaking of hebophilia, right? Like, I have heard, like, you've heard, of course, like, the Pearl, you know, tweets or quotes, right? Where she says, like, something to the effect of, like, that it's normal for men to be attracted to 16-year-olds, right? I've heard that meme so many times, like, throughout these. And, I mean, this is Pearl we're talking about, so, I mean, we can't really expect this. Where is the evidence for any of that? Does anybody actually have any studies or any actual research to back it up? Why do people say that? How do people justify that? In these fucking papers, I mean, they say, like, in these papers that were arguing against the addition of hebophilia, mm-hmm. Blanchard put some excerpts in it in that, like, five-page dissent I sent you. But I've read some of the, like, yeah. uh, responses to Blanchard's proposal of it. All of this happened in a journal called Archives of Sexual Behavior, by the way. Okay. These were, like, arguments, people going back and forth in, like, the years 2011 to 2013 before the DSM-5 was published. Okay. But very clean. They were arguing even younger than that is typical. They were saying common law was age of 13. That's the age of consent. And for a long fucking time, age of consent yeah. places, it was 13, 14, 15. This wasn't... Simone de Beauvoir... She, along with Foucault, signed Mm -hmm. a petition to abolish all age of consent laws in Mm -hmm. France. It was 15 at the time. Mm -hmm. So, like... Oh, um, it's even worse than that. I I think that Simone de Beauvoir, she used to... If I'm not mistaken, I think she used to recruit, like, female students to basically supply them to her partner, Jean Falsard, for sex. I think that's something... Yeah, she's, like, literally fucking Ghislaine Maxwell. What the fuck? Unironically. Okay, Allison... I love you. I will read all of the pedophile literature you can send me that will not wind me up on the watch list. I I swear, guys, Fairy Queen has it in her email if anybody is in this chat right now and Mm. they're like, there's no way that shit about pedophilic sexual orientation is real. That's like too fucking crazy because it sounds like it. Like, Mm. I promise Fairy Queen has it in her email now. Okay, she's able to pull it up. I gave her the page number and everything. Okay. It's fucking real. But, yeah. No, I will definitely watch it. Allison, don't get me wrong, but it's almost midnight. I got to talk about something other than pedophiles. <laughs> you got to give me something. Something oh my to God, cleanse. We're in this. different time zones. It is not almost midnight for me. But you go, okay. and I can talk to you about how I think sexology yeah. is full of scary perverts another time. Yes, absolutely. Okay, listen, we will have that conversation. We can talk. Why don't we talk about it Monday, okay? I would love to talk about it with you Monday, okay? Does, does that um, sound okay? Assuming that I, I might be tied up with school stuff, but no I will. I'll keep you updated. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Allison, you have a great one. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Bye, bye, Allison. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Let me go here. Let me go ahead and leave. Ah, where are we here? I'm gonna go ahead and leave this call. Oh, friends, it's so late. And I have to tell you, I'm exhausted. Okay.
what we're gonna do, okay? Folks, this is the last stream of this week. We are going to stream next week on Monday, okay? Next week on, on Tuesday, I have a panel with Admiral Gibbs where we're going to talk about dating. On Wednesday, I go to battle Not-So-Erudite Lavloon alongside my good friend, Rora, and alongside Brittany Simon, and we are going to talk about whether or not OnlyFans is more exploitative than, uh, than streaming careers. And sometime next week, either Thursday or Friday, I'm going to interview a soldier from the IDF, and we are going to discuss the co topic of women in combat, okay? It's gonna be great. It's gonna be awesome, okay? With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. We need to sing our song tonight. Who's got a song idea? Somebody tell me a song, an ABBA song, okay? Hmm, what's a good Amma song? Okay, we should think of an Abba song. Song by Abba. I know, okay, we're going to sing Dancing Queen, okay? Hey Alexa, play Dancing Queen. Dancing Queen by Abba on Amazon Music. Okay. <laughs> 